A good Thursday morning to you, and welcome to Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson here alongside uh, Sarah Hoyles, Samuel Brooks. This episode is presented by our friends at Bitcoin Well, our presenting sponsors here since the very first episode of Real Talk. CEO Adam O'Brien's coming up on the show. I think next week we're going to book it in, working on it right now. We're going to talk about what they're doing as a company to address some of the objections around the environmental impacts of Bitcoin mining. Really neat stuff. Two Real Talk builders, two of our partners, as a matter of fact, working together on this. That's coming up next week. If you have questions about crypto, you want to go to a trusted source for answers, check out Bitcoin Well under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. We are all over the place this show in the best way. Coming up in uh, about eight minutes' time, we're going to talk to author Warren Kinsella. I know that uh, many of you will be familiar with his political commentary. He's got a piece in the Toronto Sun. uh, Does the former special assistant to Liberal Prime Minister Jean Chrétien on current Liberal Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and it's, it's not a puff piece. It's not very flattering. As a matter of fact, he talks about the Prime Minister scanning the obituaries for photo ops following this one released by the PMO as the prime minister. For those of our podcast listeners, I'll let you know the prime minister visiting Cowess's first nation uh, and the uh, unmarked graves of hundreds and hundreds of indigenous children, children that were there at residential schools. We'll find out what prompted Warren to write the piece and his, his bigger picture perspective. He touches on Jody Wilson Raybould as well, former senior cabinet minister for the prime minister, as if I need to tell you that. Uh, Ms. Wilson-Raybould has has just recently announced within the last week or so that she's not going to be seeking re-election. You'll remember she won as an independent, so she's not seeking re-election. I've heard different theories from people on why that is, what that means, what the implications are, what it says to women, what it says to women of color, what it's so I'm always we're always curious. The show, our inbox is always open. Put it that way to talk at RyanJesperson.com. And I know that some of you are going to, I'm sure, have have thoughts on Warren being here. I'm sure that many of you are going to have thoughts now that I've mentioned, now that I, we've, we've invoked her name, Jody Wilson-Raybould. We do have an ask in, by the way, for, for the one who, you know, she she's Canada's, I'm not talking necessarily politics or leanings, uh, just acronyms and cool nicknames. Uh, she's Canada's AOC, right? JWR. She's, oh, yeah. She's got her, 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 the trifecta, like the oh, bing, yeah. bang, boom, JWR. I hope she gets back to us. Has it, been, has it been radio silence from her, or did they say no to us? They said no to us initially, uh, and then the announcement for her not seeking re-election. Because uh, we wanted the we wanted the exclusive on the announcement. Yeah, and then, uh, so yeah, we're just, I haven't gotten a no. And so I always like to say, like, you know, no news is good news. So you're <laughs> saying there's a chance. Yeah, there's always hope. All right, so Warren Kinsella coming up in just a little bit. It's Thursday, which means we have a great... Uh, Um, edition of Eat Your Words coming up, presented by Prairie Catering. Then we're going to get into purity culture. Uh Uh-huh. This is going to be, we we sort of have touched on some really interesting storylines in and out of evangelicalism, and I know that it appeals to a lot of you because you tell me that when I run into you in person. Uh, Emily Joy Allison will join us to talk about her new book, Hashtag Church 2. Kind of built off Me Too, Church Too. We're going to find out what prompted Emily to write that book. And then Dr. Sharon Morsink, an astronomer, a professor in the Department of Physics. What I'm saying without saying it is that she is way smarter than me. These are the interviews that I approach. And I just go, I hope I don't sound like an idiot when I ask these questions. We're going to be talking about what's leading to uh, potential surges in coastal flooding. So if you're tuning into the show from any areas along the West Coast, the beautiful Eastern Seaboard, wherever it may be, what does the wobbling moon... Got a bit of a wobble. The wobbling moon have to do with anything. Is this, uh, like, are you are you briefed to the point, Sarah, where you think you could kind of tee this up for us? Could, could you give us, like, a one-sentence primer on what, what a wobbling moon is? Well, it's actually, I mean, I don't want to step on the toes of, of our, you know, experts. Right. <laughs> You don't want to steal her thunder. I don't want to steal her thunder. But what I gather is, is the wobbling moon is it's part of the way that the moon works its way around the earth. Uh huh. And so, but of course, the moon impacts tides. And so as it wobbles, as it as one does, maybe it has some wobbly pops. Yeah. Uh, it uh, 
Okay, so question number one to her will be, uh, how serious is this? And number two, can we do anything about it? And if the answer to number two is no, then I don't think we should do this segment because it's just we're just going to, you know, we're just we're forecasting basically the end of real estate and life as we know it on the coast surrounding our beautiful nation. But it's important not to put our heads in the <laughs> sand. Well, speak for yourself. Okay. <laughs> can, okay. Can't we just throw a chain around the moon and just straighten it out? Can't a we do bit? something yeah. like that? Can't we? Can't we detonate? What? What we're going to do to go into space and detonate like sort of nuclear bombs and then sort of course correct the moon and get it off its? Well, wasn't since, that what we were going to do? Since Elon is out there, you yeah. might as well just ask Elon to. Well, you know what you do. And Bezos, is because well, Elon and and Bezos, and then of course Richard Branson as well. All these billionaires in in their race to space, which is which has uh, been interesting to watch because you know everybody wants to. Well, there's a lot of ego at play here. So what we want to do is make sure that we leverage that ego in a way that benefits all of us. What, what I'm talking about is is about self serving efforts uh, to get billionaires all competing to be the first. To sort out and correct the wobbling moon. Lasso the moon. So mankind, humankind, Thank you. as we know it, can continue to survive. Or we could just tax them appropriately and then we could... Oh, geez, Sarah, come on. Come on. Billionaires pay enough, don't they? Don't billionaires already pay enough? <laughs> Pat Rain is back in the UCP caucus as well. You'll remember the MLA out of uh, Lesser Slave Lake was booted by the premier after this show exclusively let you know that in addition to being one of those MLAs that had participated in the Aloha Gate scandal, you remember Mr. Rain was down uh, in Mexico during the Christmas holidays posting photos of it on his social media. He was also, having been described as a parachute candidate, spending a lot of time living and working down in Texas. And the constituents, the very, and I hate to paint you this way, I know you elected Daniel Larry Vey, the NDP would have been, uh, was a minister back in the day. You, you, you have sent an M M NDP MLA to the legislature. I acknowledge that. But for the most part... For the most part, I can safely say it's conservative country in Lesser Slave Lake. The folks of Lesser Slave Lake had had enough. You remember the letters we were getting to the show? You remember our hashtag was trending across the country? Jason Kenney booting him out of the party? Well, he's back. So why? That's the question. The announcement yesterday essentially, listen, he served six months in the penalty box. He observed the timeout, and he's worked hard to earn the trust back of his constituents. Now, we didn't just go to Bob and Sally on the street. When we talked to the mayor and the deputy mayor of Lesser Slave Lake, they pulled no punches. They didn't go so far as some of you wanted. Some of you said, well, they're still sounding pretty sympathetic to the conservatives. We don't know if we like this. And I said, well, yeah, but that's not the point. So we're endeavoring to speak to them again. We want to hear from you. I know a lot of people want to see the receipts. Pat Rain yesterday saying he's got a ton of letters from his constituents, welcoming him back, thanking him for his humility, thanking him for working hard to earn back their trust. And then he committed what could be a fatal error for politicians, and he said, I'm willing to show those letters if people would like. And now people are going, we would like. Yes, please. So they're going to want to see those letters. I'm curious to know what you think. There's some speculation that with independence already sitting out, you know, you, you remember that Todd Lowen is, is gone. Drew Barnes is gone. Pat Rain was gone. That's three independents, former United Conservative MLAs. People are saying, you know, with a fourth, maybe Angela Pitt out of Airdrie, maybe Leela Ahir out of Chestermere Strathmore. I think that one's unrealistic. But with a fourth, they form official party status. They can fundraise. They get a communication staffer, at least one. It changes things. So people are saying, I wonder if this is with, with former PM Stephen Harper talking to the caucus yesterday about playing nice and staying united under Premier Jason Kenney. You wonder if there was also a quick note there saying, listen, we feel perilously close with three independents right now to, to having a little pop up party start up here. We're going to have to start playing whack-a-mole. So bring Pat Rain in. Now it's back down to two. I don't know. If you buy it or not, you can let me know what you think. Is that tinfoil hat or is that bang on? We'll be keeping an eye on the live chat and, of course, our hashtag RealTalkRJ. The team at Kubi Energy wants us to remind you that at kubienergy.ca slash realtalk right now, you can find the details on the RealTalk Net Zero Solar Contest. That's right. Right now, we're taking your submissions. Got an amazing video out of Calgary this morning. Videos, photos, or you can just use your words. Send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Tell us why you or somebody you know deserves a full solar setup. There is no catch. It's not money towards a solar setup. Whatever it costs to get you as close to net zero as we can, we're going to do it. 
All thanks to our friends at Kubi Energy. The contest is open all the way through till next Friday. You've got eight days, and then we'll have a week of voting. Ultimately, after we narrow it down to three, Real Talkers will choose who wins that full setup, courtesy of our friends at Kubi Energy. Warren Kinsella is a Toronto-based lawyer, author, consultant. If you follow politics, which you probably do, if you listen to this show, you probably follow Warren on Twitter. He was a special assistant to Jean Chrétien. He's written 10 books, including Kicking Ass in Canadian Politics. He writes for the Wall Street Journal, The Walrus, and The Toronto Sun, which is where you'll find his recent piece, Prime Minister, Always Ready for His Close-Up, making his Real Talk debut this morning. Warren, welcome to the show. Thanks for doing it. Thanks for having me. Now, what the, you've, I mean, you've had a, a long experience in politics. You've obviously worked uh, for a liberal prime minister before, but it's been no secret. You've not been the hugest fan of, of Justin Trudeau. Generally speaking, high-level view, what is it about this guy that, that drives you a little bit nuts? Well, it's like I wrote a bit in the column. I mean, it, you know, every politician, as you would know better than me, can be a little bit uh, phony. Uh, they're actors or actresses, and, you know, we're not getting the straight goods. But, you know, what I wrote about was how this guy is in a category all of his own. Like he really there's it, it. Some days it seems to me there's absolutely nothing authentic about him. I don't know if he has any core beliefs. I don't know what his passions are. You know, obviously he's passionate about holding on to power. Um, but like he just seems like a phony to me. And and that's a big turnoff. But obviously to a lot of Canadians, it isn't. Warren, when you were when you were working for for Prime Minister Chrétien, did you I mean, on, on a daily basis or from time to time anyway, did you see evidence that you believe that there was a real depth, that there was a real substance, that it wasn't just the politicking that was driving him? Yeah, it was, you know, with Chrétien, I think it's fair to say is what you saw is what you got, you know, and he didn't pretend to be uh, anything what he was, which was a guy from a big family in a small town in in Quebec. And he was a political winner, you know, notwithstanding the fact that his opponents consistently underestimated him. Um, you know, he did OK. He won every election in 40 years. The thing we learned at his knee, Ryan, was that, you know, you undersell and overperform in politics. That's how you succeed. With Trudeau, it seems to be the reverse. He always oversells. He oversells all the time and then he under delivers. And that's a disappointment, obviously, for about you know, 60 percent of Canadians, but he's still holding on to his core. And from what we can see, it looks like he may have a shot at another majority government. Yeah, I want to talk to you about that in, in a little bit coming up. I would almost go so far as to guarantee it the way that things are looking right now, though, guaranteeing an election result two months out is probably a fool's errand. Let me for, for the people, the majority of people weren't going to hear this on a podcast, but but a lot of people are going to see it on YouTube as well. So I want to put this photo up. This is a photo that ran. This was, I, I believe, released by the prime minister. Oh, pardon me. No, it's not. It's a Getty Images. This is uh, Shannon Van Rose with Getty Images. This is the prime minister um, at the site of that former residential school, Cowessus First Nation in Saskatchewan, uh, more than. 750 bodies of children, young children, indigenous children there have been discovered marked with these flags. Um, I want to let our audience know that we're going to be talking to the chief of the Cowessus First Nation, Chief Delorme, tomorrow on the show. But Warren, what was it about that image in particular? I mean, you see images of the PM every single day. This isn't necessarily the first image relating to the conversation, the national one we're having on residential schools. What was it about this one that prompted your column? Well, who brings a personal photographer to a funeral? Who brings a personal photographer to a graveyard, you know, where there are indigenous children and babies to get themselves photographed? Like, who does that? Like, you know, why not do what other prime ministers have done, including the one I work for? And you quietly go there and extend, you know, your condolences and your regrets and your sympathies. You spend time with people. You talk to them. I mean, and that's what Obama did. That's what Biden does all the time. And we hear about it after the fact. You don't bring a damn photographer who's subsidized by the taxpayer, by the way, take pictures of you holding a teddy bear by a gravesite. It's like, you know, Trudeau, if you were really serious about Indigenous issues, as you claim to be, then why haven't you made uh, made, made uh, faith on your promise about clean water advisories. You know, why are you fighting Indigenous children in court right now? Indigenous children won a human rights award some years ago 
Trudeau has spent millions on lawyers fighting that. Like, it, it's just with this guy, it always seems to be the image and not the substance. I think that's what really set me off. We'll come back to Trudeau. Let me ask you, I mean, you, you, you've worked, you understand the, the, the mechanisms of federal government. And we've heard so many uh, politicians and commentators at, at different levels of government say, listen, we understand that federal government to meaningfully address what reconciliation would actually look like w- would be a massive undertaking. I think a lot of people, yourself included here, obviously clearly would make a compelling argument that this government really hasn't done much when it when it comes to the calls to action, uh, the report from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, et cetera. If we are going to be going to the polls this fall, which is what everybody's anticipating, people at the doors and during election forums and debates, people are going to be talking about this. Uh, what's this government's position? What's this government's approach? What's the prime minister going to say? He's been in office since 2015. Many moons have passed since that report was issued. Yeah, and, you know, if you look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, and I don't agree with everything that's in it either. You know, there's some things in there that I just don't think are achievable. But one of the things they talked about was they said, look, guys, there are, you know, 150,000 Indigenous children were forced into those places, and there were graveyards at those so-called residential schools. And I say so-called because, you know, what school did the rest of us go to have graveyards in them? But, you know, these ones did, and we believe that there's like as many as 5,000 children in those unmarked graves. Trudeau did zero until this year he's been in power for half a decade he did zero about helping indigenous uh, leaders and indigenous communities find those bodies find those kids when it gets exposed in the press as it did with the chief that you're going to be speaking to tomorrow well then he he moves to action and you know offers up money but you know i guess the cynical among us and i guess that would include me wonder if that has more to do with the election that's coming than an actual concern what do you with regards to the trc calls to action is there one that you know you can think of off the top of your head or there are a couple when you talk about ones that you don't calls to action you don't think are achievable Uh, is there one or two in particular i can't think of any off the top of my head but it's also you know the it's like the undrip the united nations declaration on indigenous peoples you know some of the things uh, we just can't do or we can't we can't afford to do them let's say in the short term. And, um, uh, you know, I think that the, they do create some difficulty, but the indigenous leaders that I know, and I've represented indigenous leaders from the Yukon to Atlantic Canada for many years, have said to me, that's fine, we get that. You know, we know some things can't be done right away. They don't necessarily agree with everything that's in these various reports, but they said, you know, have a real dialogue with us. But when a young woman, you know, who is about 100 pounds soaking wet shows up at an exclusive liberal fundraiser in Toronto, Trudeau has her thrown out by some security guards onto the sidewalk, you know, and sneers at her, thanks for your donation. I think it's in moments like that that we see who this guy really is and what he really cares about with Indigenous people, which is about zero. He really doesn't care for them. And, you know, you know, Harper, I'm not a card carrying member of any party, but, you know, there was one department that, whose budget grew, only one that grew during the Harper decade, and that was Indian and Northern Affairs. And I think that while he doesn't get credit for it, I think that he did a reasonable job. Uh, Trudeau, again, it's, you know, a sizzle before the stake. He talks a good game, but he's not delivering. Yeah, if you ever had the, the chance to talk to uh, former and the now late uh, former Alberta Premier Jim Prentice, I know he's very proud of a lot of the work that he did uh, in that department under, under Stephen Harper for many years. You you write about uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould, um, who's obviously, uh, I, I, I suppose, related or not, has recently announced that she won't seek re-election. And, and I'd be curious for your speculation on why she may have made that decision. But but how do you think that this plays into the indictment of Trudeau? You, you essentially... You suggest that she is or epitomizes the polar opposite of of his entire ethos. Yeah. And, you know, full disclosure, she's a friend of mine and I've supported her for many years. And I was really sad to see her make her decision. But I understand it. I've talked to her about it. You know, and I I don't think we've heard the last of Jody Wilson-Raybould. So that's good for the country. But, um, 
you know, like Trudeau came into power, for example, saying, as you pointed out a few minutes ago, that he would bring about reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. Well, here he had a prominent Indigenous leader in his cabinet, and he exiled her. He kicked her out of his party, you know, caucus. Um, you know, here's a, a principled woman who, and a lawyer, who just refused to obstruct justice in the way that he wanted her to on behalf of a Quebec-based Liberal Party donor. You know, it, I think that in everything that Jody did as um, a member of parliament and as a cabinet minister, it really contrasted to what Trudeau did, you know, on ethics, on reconciliation with Indigenous people, on his feminism. You know, he pledges, says he claims to be a feminist all the time. Well, here he has this very prominent, this brilliant woman in his cabinet, and he defamed her and demeaned her and drove her out. And, um, you know, I think in that actions like those, we see who this guy really is. Do you think, I mean, people oftentimes, and it made sense, I mean, timing and otherwise, also the fact that they were both senior cabinet ministers when Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott sort of hit that chopping block. Uh, people were saying, yeah, the feminist prime minister d dispatching two prominent female cabinet ministers. And, you know, there was some conversation, whether it's people chewing the fat or otherwise, that were going, I mean, one may be a coincidence, two could be a coincidence. Is it fair to tie this to feminism? Does the, does the fact that these were strong women have anything to do with the fact, or would this be any different if these were two strong personality or two alpha type men in the cabinet? Do you think that it's fair to, to put this up against his so-called feminist platform? Well, not only do I think it's fair, I think that we have to. He is the one who's repeatedly said from his very first day seeking the leadership of the Liberal Party and then becoming prime minister that he was a feminist. You know, gave speeches saying, guys, it's OK to call yourself a feminist. And like, you know, I'm I know I'm a son of a mom and I'm a dad to a daughter. And I don't think, Ryan, that I'm entitled to give myself that title, you know, as a feminist. Uh, I've got to learn and I've got to do better as a man. But this guy, you know, he's just he's handing out this title to himself. OK, fine. Well, then act upon it. You know, show us that that is, in, in fact, the case. But Jody Wilson, Ray, Ray Bolt and Jane Philpott, as you pointed out, and, uh, you know, uh, there's a number. Actually, there's been a number of women in the Liberal caucus who have been driven out him, by him or marginalized that haven't received as much publicity. And, I, you know, if you talk to them, and I encourage you to do so, they'll all say the same thing. This guy ain't no feminist. Right? We, had a, we had a really Words interesting, uh, sorry, Warren, we had, we had an interesting conversation, I guess, about two months ago with Selena Cesar Chavez when she released her new book. Go. And I mean, that was, a, I think, another example that we could probably include in the conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. And she was, uh, you know, she has some some very uh, direct things to say about the guy. And uh, but there, you know, there were female members of parliament from Quebec who were just, you know, because they disagreed with him on some things that were quite minor, were denied uh, a reappointment of their candidacy. And um, so, you know, I think that really is who this guy is. is and he, he's not a feminist. You know, I think he's barely somebody who believes in treating women with equality and decency and respect. And, um, you know, I don't think he deserves re-election, but unfortunately, it looks like he's going to get it. Yeah, I agree with you. Let's uh, let's I want to look at some of the comments here. I'll rattle off a bunch. Love for you to respond on on what you'd like. Erica says, uh, says, Ryan, she says, please don't be comparing JWR to AOC, says Jody Wilson. Raybould's a damn hero. Uh, AOC is a shallow attention seeker who regurgitates popular talking points and virtue signals for headlines. I don't know about that. Uh, I think AOC is a force of nature. I'm not comparing the policy. I'm just comparing the cool nicknames. Penny says, good grief, you two. Says these guys all take photographers everywhere they go. Aaron O'Toole did it just a couple of weeks ago as well. You know, Jagmeet Singh on TikTok all the time, grabbing media attention. Conservatives, you know, they don't get to whine about any of this, you guys. I mean, come on. You got to be kidding me. Uh, my meantime, Kat says, all right, so show me a leader capable of leading the country right now. Show me an alternative. There isn't one. Is everybody the same on this, Warren? Is this federal election? I mean, whether you're talking about attention seeking party leaders or fake feminism or whatever you want to talk about. I mean, is this just going to be the choice of the least worst option for Canadians? 
looks like it. You know, it's not like, you know, what the one reader is saying, you know, what about, what about, what about, um, you know, my opinion, they all suck. I think they're all terrible leaders. O'Toole, I think, is going to lose seats mm -hmm. that Shear got. You know, Shear couldn't win against the blackface guy, the guy who obstructed justice. Well, I think O'Toole is going to do even worse than that. The guy who is considered the most popular, if you look at the polling right now, is Jagmeet Singh in the NDP. But my strong suspicion is that's what always happens with the NDP between elections, is they become a parking lot for people's affections, and then those people flee them and vote for somebody else. So really, there's nobody to get terribly excited about in Ottawa these days. In fact, I think it's probably the worst crop of federal leaders that we've had in my lifetime. Really, it, it's hard to get excited about any of them. So, you know, the reader is saying, well, what about the other ones? Well, it's like, I think they're all not very good either. You know, I just think Trudeau in particular is the worst prime minister in a generation. In a generation? What do you, when it comes to, you know, what Aaron O'Toole could have done, uh, I know that, I mean, to, to really oversimplify it, people would say you've got to bring back moderate or progressive, you know, middle of the road conservatives and you've got to win bigger in the bigger cities. Those would probably be like two of the, you know, he rolled out a climate plan that I know earned him a lot of shots from the right. Uh, a lot of people, I, but I think it was somewhat of, or at least his version of an olive branch to try to get people's attention, yet still he's languishing in the polls. And I would be inclined to agree with you. I don't think he's going to fare as well as Andrew Scheer did, who didn't fare as well as people thought he probably could what did Aaron O'Toole do wrong where did he miss the mark and can he salvage it to him I mean it's always hard for an opposition leader to get attention of guys like you you know when you're in government you've got the power you've got the money the media is paying attention to you, the public's paying attention to you. so it's hard to break through when you're an opposition leader it's probably even harder during a pandemic but I mean, those things are all excuses. One thing that O'Toole could have done, and I actually said this to a couple of his guys, they said, what would you do? I said, well, what is the biggest issue we're all facing right now? You know, the pandemic, like it is the biggest cultural, political, personal event, economic event of all of our lifetimes. You know, I can't remember I, the last time I heard the Conservative Party of Canada or the NDP for that matter, come up with a good idea with respect to the pandemic. You know, they've got doctors in their caucus. They've got former nurses in their caucus. They've got smart people who understand health policy. Guys, all of us, you know, everybody listening to us today, I think would feel that they wanted to hear some good ideas about the pandemic because there's no question Trudeau flubbed vaccine acquisition, right? As of this morning, we're I think number 35 in the world still in terms of fully vaccinated. That's a failure. That's a failure. I think we're sixth in the G7 for fully vaccinated. Why isn't Aaron O'Toole talking about that? Why isn't his health critic, Michelle Rempel Garner, out there talking about it? She knows how to get attention. Why aren't they talking about ideas? That's something concrete and meaningful that Aaron O'Toole and his team could have done, and they just didn't do it. Mm. You know what's weird when you say it's, it's hard for a guy like him to get the attention of guys like me? Aaron O'Toole in opposition we've asked him five or six times to come on the show like we, we, we've asked him many times to come on the show Pierre Polyev was coming on the show bailed at the last minute Aaron O'Toole's office has now gone incommunicado radio silent they at least used to be interacting with us now I have a whole bunch of theories about why that's happening but he won't do an interview on this show and this is a a, a show that's hosted by a small p small c progressive conservative my heart on my sleeve my affiliation there to be grabbed that to me, and people will say, well, Jesperson and his sour grapes, because he can get the PM, and we've got Jagmeet Singh, and we've had Anime Paul, and we're going to talk to Blanchette as well with the BQ. We want to talk to all the leaders. We can't get O'Toole on the show. That to me yeah. says something. He's not going to reach out. He's not going to have conversations here in the gray areas. To me, you're going to lose the election. Yeah, and and consider this he was you know everybody goes i'm from calgary as you know and, you know everybody goes to the stampede and it's a lot of fun but it's not a hard campaigning event you know last week aaron o'toole was doing campaign events at the stampede that's because he's lost 20 according to some pollsters he's lost 20 percent of his support in the province of alberta 
Now, that doesn't mean that he's not going to win the majority of seats. I believe that he is. But when he's losing that much support in Alberta, when he's not going on shows like yours, that tells you that this guy needs to take a look at the fundamentals and make some big changes. But he's not doing it. And it's too late. I believe that the election is going to be called on August the 9th for a vote in the month of September. And, you know, as of right now, as of this moment, as of today, Aaron O'Toole is looking at a loss of seats. There are now some people speculating that his party is going to go to third place. He's doing that badly. I have a hard time believing that. Do you? It's possible. It's happened. I mean, you know, Liberal Party of Canada under Mike Lignati, if went to third place, nobody believed that either. So we live in a weird time. I mean, who would have predicted, you know, a former reality TV host, you know, with uh, with a terrible reputation could become president of the United States? He did. So um, the one thing I've learned in the present era is all the things that I think I used to know about politics, I've got to throw out and look at differently. And I think right now, O'Toole, for all the reasons you have been talking about, he's just not doing what he has to do. And now he's out of time, right? He's out of a runway in order to present himself to the Canadian people. The one thing I always say to people, you know, when the conversation comes up about O'Toole, that always kind of leaves them a little speechless. I say to them, guess who's younger? Hmm. And they say, what do you mean? And I say, well, which, which federal leader is younger? I was like, Justin Trudeau's older than Aaron O'Toole. And there's always a long silence, like, holy. I said, exactly, right? The guy who seems more passionate and inspiring, you know, he's a dud in my opinion, but he's, you know, vital and youthful, is Justin Trudeau, who's the older guy. Aaron O'Toole looks like he's 100 years old. What do you say to the people that go, yeah, can sell it? This is just, you got an ax to grind. This is personal, Kinsella can't stand Justin Trudeau, hasn't been able to stand him forever. This is nothing more than personal. What do you say to people? I don't give a crap what they think. (laughs) That's my short answer. (laughs) This is what I think. Do you think I would not be making more money if I was kissing Justin Trudeau's keister? Believe me, I would, right? You know, I would be able to have, you know, do all kinds of work through my firm uh, in Ottawa. I don't because I'm saying what I believe. And what I believe is this guy is a disaster. So, you know, people can call it sour grapes if they want. I don't give a damn. They can say whatever they want. Warren, do you believe, is there an heir apparent in the Liberal Party? I, I, actually, I'd love to ask no. you this question about, I want to ask you about the Conservatives too, but let me ask you about the Liberals first. You, you, you didn't even have to think about it. You say no. Uh, what gives you such, what, what gives you that sense and why do you think that is? It relates to something we were just talking about in the, uh, coming out of your last question. You know, Justin Trudeau, you got to give him credit. He led the Liberal Party from third place to first. Mm -hmm. That's something that doesn't happen very often, not just in Canadian politics, in any political environment. That was a big, big achievement. And so what happened was he took, basically, he won a majority government, moved from third place, to a whole bunch of newbies, a whole bunch of people who had never been in politics before. They owe him everything. There isn't one of them, and I talked to enough of them, who would lift a finger to oppose the guy in the way that, you know, uh, Paul Martin opposed my my guy, Jean Chrétien, or, you know, other people oppose Paul Martin or John Turner or what have you. There's nobody doing that because they feel they owe everything to Trudeau. That's why I often, it feels like a cult sometimes. He's the cult leader, and his leadership, his power is undisputed. So let me let me ask because I'm I'm a I'm a child of the seven. I was born in seventy seven though, so I guess I'm probably actually a child of the eighties. So all my my understanding of Trudeau Trudeau mania et cetera is is based on what I've read and videos I've watched in earnest. And you know, but I didn't live it. I don't I don't remember you know the prime minister with the boutonniere all the time with women going nuts. And it's just it's not really the politics that you see these days. How is Pierre Elliott? different from Justin in the sense of, a, of those with a cult following, those with that ability to compel people with messaging. I mean, both of them are obviously skilled communicators, but where do you see the biggest differences? Well, where I saw the biggest difference, and I say this as an Albertan, you know, I grew up in uh, Calgary, went to high school in Calgary. And, you know, when the NEP hit, which was the signature energy policy of the Pierre Trudeau era, like it destroyed Alberta. 
right? It really did. You know, like I'd go to school and a kid who used to sit beside me in a desk was gone because his parents had lost everything and they had to move back to Nova Scotia or where, what have you. Um, but the thing about him, you know, because Mr. Lockheed did battle with him and so on. The thing about Pierre Trudeau is that you actually knew he did have core beliefs. You actually knew that he had thought about things. You know, we in Alberta often disagreed with him, but he was you know, honest about where he stood on the issues. And, you know, he had some intellectual heft. He was a pretty smart guy. You, you needed to take him seriously. And Lougheed and others did. And they ended up working together. And, for example, bringing us, you know, repatriating the Constitution and giving us a charter of rights and freedoms. Those, those leaders, those, you know, and Trudeau, uh, Pierre Trudeau, did that. What's Justin Trudeau's achievement? Let the question marinate and flow like, for a second, so people I, I can chew on it. I wonder. I wonder. Well, thank yeah. you, Mexican. I'm trying. To, I'm trying to think of what's changed most in Canada. Uh, I'm trying to think of what's changed most in Canada under Justin Trudeau. I don't want to say a word. I'm. I'm I, I see we are frozen. Can you still hear me? Okay, we may have. Yeah, but oh, it's breaking up. There you are. Okay, it's breaking up. We'll do our best. And we'll wrap here. I've got no. That's fine. I, I'm. I'm trying to think. Actually, okay. the biggest difference in Canada since he's like. Legal cannabis. I know he doesn't. I'm not saying that's his legacy, but that's probably the biggest change. I don't know. Yeah, I guess, you know, and Jody Wilson Raybould was the one who brought it in, not him. Yeah. Let me ask you he this in closing. I, I remember, Warren, back, I mean, back in the day in the Harper era, you'd, you'd take a look at that front bench, right? And just off the top of my head, you'd go at any at any moment right now Ronna Ambrose or Jason Kenny or John Baird or Peter McKay or any number of uh, any other name 15 deep on a list could take over the leadership of that party and i think convince now this is my western canadian perspective and this is my recollection from the mid 2000s etc but you would you, you had the impression that that any number of 8 or 10 senior cabinet ministers could be capable could have that prime ministerial quality to them and I look at the Conservative Party of Canada of today, and I'm not saying that there aren't some skilled politicians there, but I don't have the same sense about the depth of the bench, if you know what I mean. Yeah, Why do you I, think that is? Well, because they've been losing elections against the weakest prime minister in a generation, right? When you can't even beat a guy who uh, had to admit that he wore racist blackface three times in the middle of an election campaign, if you can't score on an empty net like that, well, you've got a big, big problem. You've got a problem of philosophy and your people and your leadership. And so, um, you know, they need to change that. Uh, Andrew Coyne's got an excellent column in the Globe and Mail today about this. He said, you know, it's not just leadership that's a problem in the Conservative Party. It's their attitude. You know, they have this chip on their shoulder that everybody's out to get them. And poor me. I can tell you, I work for political parties across this country. You know, the media... That's our role in the media is to knock around political parties and politicians and test them. That's democracy. That's good for democracy. But, you know, there's just a bunch of whiners within the conservative movement say, oh, you know, the media is out to get me. Well, you know, you just gave me an excellent example a few minutes ago. You've asked Aaron O'Toole to be on your show five times and he hasn't even come on. And so that to me is one of the biggest problems these guys have got. They need to grow up pull up their boots and, and stop whining and come up with some good ideas and talk about positive change and not just what they're against. Dwayne's using our hashtag real talk, RJ. Uh, he says the oil industry in Texas, you two suffered greatly and they had no national energy program. Why is the NEP an excuse for Alberta's problems? Excuse? Well, it was real. I mean, even Trudeau, Justin Trudeau himself admitted that it was a mistake. It's not an excuse. It's reality. It's historical reality. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You think Jason Kenney's going to, first of all, lead the United Conservatives into the next provincial election in Alberta? And if he does, do you think that he'll win re-election? Which United Conservative Party? Looks to me like he's trying to lead two different parties with one name. Um, it's hard to ride two surfboards at once. Uh, I'm not sure he's going to be successful yeah i'm with you on that one where it's going to be interesting to watch really appreciate your availability today enjoyed the column thanks for making time for us warren thanks ryan have a good one yeah you as well that's warren kinsella you can check out his work at warrenkinsella.com you can find him on twitter at kinsella warren 
Some of you think he's bang on. Some of you can't stand him. That, to me, is the sign of a perfect guest booking. I love it. I'm just, I, try, I sometimes try to catch up real quick on the, on the live chat, though. Yesterday, I, I got the impression people, did, people thought I missed the mark a little bit because I just dropped in on the live chat. Mm. And I just, I just pulled a chunk out and started commenting on it. People talking about influencers and popular culture and those sorts of things. Doggos. And, and as soon as I started offering my hot take on that, just on that grab and go portion of the live chat, people are, there were about 10 comments in a row that were like, Jesperson's missing the point. Jesperson doesn't get it. He should stop talking. He, he's, he's way off the mark. So I, 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 so I hesitate to just drop in on the live chat when I haven't seen the ongoing conversation. Jeremiah says, Kinsella is a closet conservative. What is closet conservative, though? And, and I appreciate that Jeremiah used the small C for mm. conservative because there's a difference there. What is a closet conservative? I mean, if you're a small L liberal, there, there are people that would vote conservative or liberal in a provincial election and, and do the exact opposite in a federal election. Mm -hmm. The B.C. liberals are a conservative party. The Alberta party is a conservative party. I'm not sure that they would say, I think they would say that. I think they would say that. They're certainly not left-leaning. They're probably, people would say, a centrist party or center-right. But what does closet conservative mean? I'm probably a closet conservative, to be honest. But with this malarkey, I'll stay in the closet. Thank you very much. Nicole says, you know, it's so annoying when people talk about blackface but can't or don't address any other race issues. <laughs> the watcher with maybe the comment of the day and I'll acknowledge that we still have about an hour to go. The watcher says, I think I hold conservative values, but I don't think conservative parties do. Interesting. The watcher, if we did have prizes to mail out to folks with great takes, you would be getting a prize. Unfortunately, we don't. That's something we could work on. Mm -hmm. Comment of the week or tweet of the week or text of the week. That'd be kind of cool. Sandra says when you're talking about accomplishments or legacies of this prime minister, he bought a pipeline and then she has a smiley face on the end because it kind of I think she knows that she's. Sandra just poured like a big doggy dish full of kerosene and lit a match and smiled and walked away. That's what she did. <laughs> What would you actually say, though, you two? I'm curious to pick your brains, Sarah, Sam. If you put on the spot, but I think that's what makes it best, put on the spot, what would you say is the number one? If the prime minister were to say, I'm, I'm, I'm walking away from politics, I'm, I'm accepting, a, I'm, I'm going to go be whatever at the United Nations. Cannabis. Or at the World Economic Forum. You'd say that was his number one thing? Because he would never say legalizing. He would never say, it wouldn't even be in his top 10, I don't think. I'm, I'm sure, yeah, I agree with you, but I, I think cannabis, I mean... <sighs> The promises that he made to our indigenous, not our, indigenous folks yep. um, have not actually seen any movement on. I mean, uh, that was one of the biggest things he promised was yeah. getting water. Just water. People in the live chat were saying, listen, there were 150 boil water advisories. There's now about 50. They were saying it's not true. And I actually had an, an audience member send me an email about a month ago. I wish I could remember the name so I could credit them. But but I had made a comment about how the, the prime minister had basically done, or let me say this government, had basically done diddly squat on mm. the boil water advisories. And we got an email from someone that said that sort of laid it out and said that's just not entirely accurate. FYI. The work is not done. Okay. But not entirely accurate, which I was like, okay. Yeah, you know, Sam, what would you say? What would you say if you were to talk about legacy or you'd say, you know, what was the one thing maybe 10 years down the road? What will people be talking about? What would you think it would be I, I, like? I think that there's sort of there's some there's some hard legacies that that garner a little bit of international attention. I, I actually think, um, you know, right off the bat, Trudeau coming into power uh, put Canada in a little bit of a spotlight that we hadn't been in for a while. And I think that, you know, just uh, a, a renewed attention on Canada in the international community was probably sort of the legacy at least right off the bat um cannabis i think is is interesting for a couple of things mostly because it was you know we're, we're the first major major nation in the world to fully legalize it and we basically wrote the playbook for other nations and i think that you know 
over time, that will be a legacy in a way of you're going to see policymakers around the world looking at what Canada did if they're trying to make this kind of a move. So I think it's it's one of those things that it's a small thing, but it kind of balloons how would into you, a big thing. How would you, j- just to challenge you in the spirit of like, we're out for beers and I'm challenging you. When you say that essentially, and I'm not, these are not your words, that you, but you're basically saying Canada, Canada wrote the textbook on legalizing cannabis. They wrote the playbook for all the other nations to follow. They, you're implying that Canada rolled it out successfully. Um, what would you say to, to make the argument that Canada rolled it out successfully? What would be the key points you would, like, what would you say? Bing, bang, and boom. Here's the, the things that I think that indicate it was a success. Well, I, the funny thing is, is like, I'm not. I think it was a success in that, like, it's everywhere and it's widespread and it sort of worked. Um, I think that there's, you know, interestingly enough, if you get into the weeds, I actually think that nice one. some pro- <laughs> some provinces have treated it way better than others. Like, you know, Alberta took it in the direction that we treat liquor with and went with yeah. more of a privatization strategy. And, and you know, I, I, I am absolutely a on the left-leaning side of the liberals, but I think that this is one of those things that totally belongs in the private sector. Me too. And I think that, you know, part of the the playbook that Canada's written is this diverse set of policy across different provinces and kind of zeroing in on what worked and what didn't. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I and I appreciate the the points. I w- I would say there are still major challenges that remain, but oh, also absolutely. but also you took something that was like a a prohibited I mean, I would imagine law enforcement listening to the show may correct me on this because I don't know if weed actually. Well, it's criminal. We don't really. I know, but we don't really use the word in Canada as much as you hear in the States. I just watch lots of episodes of cops and things like that. But narcotic or like a classified as like a like it was like a drug, like a prohibited drug. Right. Uh, Let me tell you something. I mean, this is just real life. This is real life. Just literally yesterday. I harnessed our put a leash on our dog on Moses. I'm walking in the back alley legally light up a joint and I have my ear pods in my earbuds, right? And I'm listening to music and I'm walking down the alley, nobody near us, nobody around us. And we're walking down the hallway and all of a sudden I kind of hear someone go, Hey pup, you know, Hey boy, like a couple of people talking to the dog. So I kind of, I, you know, I look around and there's four cops on mountain bikes and I've just got this. And if you know me, my friends call me the role model. I don't roll them small, put it that way. Technically you might refer to it as a gagger. And I've got this thing burning in front of four cops, and it took me a second to be like, it's allowed. You're okay, Jespo. You're I'm okay. okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. So I actually took a little hoot. <laughs> Blew it in their face night. No. And then I said, how's it going? How's the night? And they were like, yeah, it's going well. Going great. I said, work safe. And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they were on their way. Mm-hmm. I, went, I went, gosh, you know, it's been legal for like four years, but that still felt kind of weird. Yeah. People are going to write in now and say, that's your privilege, which is probably true. But when we talk about things like legal cannabis and whether or not it was successful, how many people are how many people that use cannabis in Canada are buying legally from a retailer and paying proper taxes on it? Way less than 50 percent. I guarantee it. Way less than 50 percent. It's not stomped out the black market, though. I don't know that anybody realistically thought that it would. People right. say, well, this is a way to hit organized crime where it hurts. Eh, organized crime has been pretty well organized for centuries. So I don't know if it's going to hit them there. With regards to expunging criminal records of people that, you know, uh, that have been prohibited from traveling or securing certain employment because yeah. of minor possession charges 30 years ago, the federal government talked big game on that, but that's, that's not really happened. That's not really been the case. So, so I don't think that's a success. But generally speaking, we went, like you said, Sam, from like zero to 60 in, you know, basically a year. You remember police officers, the police chiefs across Canada were saying, we're not ready to enforce this. This is being rushed. This is too fast. Without taking anything away from, I'm, I'm, you know, we could hear from Mothers Against Drunk Driving right now. They'd probably mm. be super pissed at me to say this because there have been instances, tragic instances where people, you know, have had motor vehicle accidents and there have been fatalities and cannabis has been involved. But guess what? That's been the case forever. Since cars were around, I mean, people have been driving impaired as long as people have been driving. I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying there's no compelling evidence that instances of impaired driving, that cannabis impaired driving have skyrocketed. It's not leading the headlines every single week, you know, across the country that, you know, fatalities are out of control because all these, you know, snoozing stoners are behind the wheel on the highways. That's just not the case. 
Yeah, and I think that there's um, that's kind of part of the point of where I was saying that you know looking at this from a little bit of an international perspective, right? Is that like Canada went into this sort of eyes wide open, but we were we were playing pretty blind. We you know we thought that this might cause some problems, and there was widespread concern, and there was all of this law enforcement concern, and then nothing kind of happened. And and it takes a nation to just do this and prove that it can be done or be ready to deal with the problems if they come for the rest of the world to gain a little bit of confidence on this file. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that when I talked about like hard legacies and soft legacies, I think the softer legacy of Trudeau is whether it's fully attributed to him because he also, you know, occupied... Uh, I was going to say uh, Sussex Drive, but he doesn't live there. Um, but he he was he was in the prime minister's office at the same time as Donald Trump, so there was you know this massive kind of like polarization just globally in general. But I do think that Trudeau coming in and a man named Trudeau running the Liberals again made the other parties dig their heels in a bit more. It actually turned the temperature up on Canadian well, it politics. Just, it just triggers exactly. Western Canada. Yeah, so I think that it's it's also one of those things that like. Part of the legacy is going to be the fact that, you know, Canada is just hotter now. It's people are triggered. People are angrier now. There's way more polarization it's than the, I think there was. It's not just was. Canada either. It's the world. Yeah. Right? You look at, and well, I mean the world. I'm going to pick three examples. But it just feels like politics these days, off the top of my head, Brexit. You look at the the debate. You call it debate around Brexit and how furious people have been there. You look at, at the United States. You know, Warren was talking about Warren Kinsella, who just joined us, talking about, you know, Donald Trump and how this this sort of former reality TV show host goes on to, you know, become the the president of the United States and ultimately drive a coup against the Capitol. And what was, uh, in my mind, one of the more surreal news events of my life. Sam, you and I were sitting in here on January 6th, watching on our monitors, watching live coverage. This is this was um this was January 6th, uh, BH, uh, before Hoyles. So, but the two of us, thank you, thank Sam you. and I, Sam and I sat in here for hours and just, I watched aghast. And I know that every person listening to this podcast or everyone watching this on YouTube is probably nodding in their own way. And because you remember where you were, right? It's like a nine 11 moment. It's if you were around, it's like a Pearl Harbor moment. It's like a JFK got shot moment. Mm-hmm. It's, it's that the challenger, the space shuttle exploded moment. Sidney Crosby golden goal moment. You, where were you? You know where you were. I remember the Di- when Diana, Princess Diana yes, died. Yes, where were you? I was camping out uh, just a little bit outside of Calgary. How did you hear on a campground? I don't even remember because I think we were still in flip phone phase yeah. at that point. So uh, it, I think it was over the news and the, on the radio. Were you, uh, I'm, I'm phrasing this, I realized before I asked the question, I'm phrasing it in a strange way, but were you a fan of hers? Was no. She, did it, it didn't, uh, it didn't like. No, I wasn't like, a, I, I'm not a royal watcher. It didn't rock I'm your, not a, but it was very significant. Oh yeah. And oh, then, of yeah. course, everything after people saying, well, they were trying to escape the paparazzi. And then that became this big thing about about celebrities and paparazzi. And people got talking about and then the allegations from Tony Fayette's family that maybe the, the royals had them killed. And I mean, wow. Right. That's unresolved. That's still that's the grassy knoll on that one. Mm-hmm. There's a new book out that shows that top U.S. generals here for perspective on January 6th, top U.S. generals planned ways to stop President Donald Trump in case of a coup. Uh, per reporting by CNN's Jamie Gangle, the, the top U.S. military officer, the top officer of the top military in the world. Chairman, well, now people are probably chime in on whether or not the Americans are the top military in the world. Are they still? I think they still are. I think they still are. I, I would say they still are. I would yeah. say America, but, but as if we want to have people start. I mean, you talk about putting Branson against Elon Musk, against Jeff Bezos. I don't want to get China, another China versus War. Russia versus yeah. the U.S., uh, never mind Iran, never mind North Korea. Uh, but this is chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Mark Milley, was so shaken, this per CNN, that then President Donald Trump and his allies might attempt a coup after the November election that Milley and other top officials informally planned for different ways to stop the president. You ever say something where you're, when it's coming out, the words are coming out of your mouth and you're going, what are we talking about yeah. right now? How did we get here? How did we get here? I was uh, on that same walk last night. It was a good walk. <laughs> a lot happened. There's a lot happening. Well, that's what happens. You know, you, you go out to walk the dog for 20 minutes and you smoke a joint and then 90 minutes later you come home. 
But I was listening to Sarah Kenzier, and she's been on the show before. Really, really like Sarah, uh, co-host of Gaslit Nation, the podcast. And she was on yesterday. I've, she's she's uh, Sarah would certainly. I never asked her, like, are you a card carrying Democrat? But it's pretty obvious she's not a Republican. So, mm. you know, she plants her flag. But her commentary on the most recent pod, and I encourage you to check out Gaslit Nation. She was asking that same sort of a question going, who are we as a nation that a president, a sitting president, can can organize a coup against the Capitol and like and, and she starts going on and she keeps asking and she goes point after point, who are we as a nation if this happens? Who are we as a nation if this can happen? Who are we as a nation if we don't respond to this? And that exercise I think can be a productive one in different contexts. Who are we as a nation if? And you could probably argue to bring this full circle that those are the exact types of conversations that we've been having, including this one with Warren Kinsella around reconciliation. Who are we as a nation if or if not this? In other words, what do we insist defines us as a community? And what does leadership look like? We want to hear from you. You can send us, uh, of course, you know, emails anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Sandra says, didn't, didn't Trudeau make cabinet more diverse with 50% women? There was a gender equitable can, uh, cabinet. You, Hoyles, you, you, you just about fell back in your chair there. No, that was, that was I was being overdramatic. No, you didn't. No, but you raised I your I was hands. not being dramatic. You, raised, you were being I was being dramatic about you being kind of dramatic. <laughs> but, but, but Sandra's technically not wrong. Remember his? Why did you do it, Prime Minister? Because it's 2015. And everybody went, ooh, ooh oh, oh, he's such a oh, feminist. Oh, he's so unlike Stephen oh, Harper. Oh. But what, you don't, think, you don't uh. think he gets cred for that? You don't, you're not going to give him two points for that? No, I'm not. How come? Because uh, I think to his, to his statement, it's 2015, and well, it's not 2021, but um, that's just being representative of the country. It's, it should not be, you know, toot the horns, wave the flags type of thing. It should just be how it is. And it's getting with the times. Uh, so to me, I'm kind of like, if it wasn't him, it was going to be somebody else. Uh, hmm. So, I mean. Jillian says Trudeau triggers the West and Western anger in, the way, in a way that Easterners cannot understand. She says, I always say growing up in Quebec, I had no idea which prairie Alberta was. We don't talk about Alberta and they don't care, says Jillian out of Eastern Canada. Meantime, a bunch of people are chiming in with their own time stopping events. This is really interesting to see because we just rattled off some off the top of our heads JFK, the Challenger explosion, Pearl Harbor, 9 11, the tornado in Edmonton in our home city back in 1987, Black Friday, they call it a time stopping event, say many people. Kimberly says, when Diana died, I was in Waterton in staff accommodations. My dad. Oh, my gosh. I didn't read this through the whole way. Um, <laughs> when Diana died, I was in Waterton in staff accommodations, and my dad left a message with my drunk roommate that somebody died. And when I called back, I was relieved to hear it was just Diana. That from Kimberly. Yee. I think she probably just means it wasn't somebody that she knew and dearly loved, right? Yeah. I had just moved into residence at university out on the West Coast. It, like When I mean just, I mean hours before. Really? Yeah. And I don't want to brag, but I had my own TV. Oh, pretty Did fancy. Did you actually have cable? It was not. No. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> No, I didn't have cable. <laughs> I had to knock you down a couple yeah, pegs well, there. Yeah, well, I was about to knock it down to tell you that, first of all, it was a Daewoo TV, which was like, not, not, not yeah, Daewoo at that time was mostly making cars, uh, but they also had a brief foray into televisions, which is not unusual if you look at the big brands. I mean, Yamaha makes pianos and motorcycles, but... Yeah, that's but never made sense to me. It's never made sense to me at all. So I had this Daewoo TV, and, uh, and you know, these were, these were modest times, but I had the old school rabbit ears. And we plugged in. It was it was like it felt like out of a movie. But everybody is their own experience feels like it's out of a movie. But we plugged in the rabbit ears. It was probably, I don't know, 10 o'clock at night or something like that. It was move in day. I was starting to unpack, put my stamp on my room, on my little broom closet of a room and plugged in the um, rabbit ears, turned on the TV. And it was on every channel that we could get, which was only three or four channels. But Princess Diana and Dodie Alphine had, had, had died in the tunnel in Paris. I couldn't believe it, obviously. And that was one of the first. So then these these new 
um, what do you call them? Like, you know, roommates kind of in a way, like, you know, neighbors uh, in this dorm. We're all, I was, because I, I, again, I don't want to brag, but I don't know if I mentioned, but I had a TV. And so, but they all came in. And so there were five or six or seven of us meeting for the first time around this news event. Never forget it. Everyone's got their own stories. It is Thursday. And of course, you know what that means. Every Thursday, we present Eat Your Words, presented by the team at Prairie Catering. Now, in this week's edition of Eat Your Words, we take a look at the wide world of sports, in particular, the National Hockey League, in particular, our hometown Edmonton Oilers. You may have heard they've just secured the services of no doubt guaranteed first ballot Hall of Famer defenseman Duncan Keith. The Oilers announcing by way of Twitter, they acquired Duncan Keith and Tim Soderlund from the Chicago Blackhawks in exchange for Caleb Jones and a conditional draft pick in 2022. Well, right away, it prompted responses like this from off-season Jason, who said, I'm sorry for your next 24 hours, blameless social media person. We started to see comments from people, people that did not love the trade, to say the very least. You could see it on Twitter. People leaving comments like, like this one, the one you can see right there, where they're saying, hang on a second, all I have to say is he better perform. If he doesn't, he's going to get eaten alive by the fans and media in Edmonton. Someone said, I'd like to speak to your manager, Edmonton Oilers. What about this one from Christian, who said, well, I just lost all my life savings. I bet every penny I own that the Edmonton Oilers would not trade a 24-year-old defenseman in a mid-round pick for an aging defenseman four days away from turning 38. I was somehow wrong. That from Zay. Let me provide a little bit of a perspective check here, my friends. You'll remember about 20 years ago, a future first ballot Hall of Fame defenseman by the name of Raymond Bork was traded at age 39 from the Boston Bruins to the Colorado Avalanche, where he went on at age 40 to win a Stanley Cup. What about this fella? You you may recognize the name. Henry Ford. Yeah, that's right. Every year there are millions of automobiles manufactured bearing his name. Did you know that Henry Ford founded the Ford Motor Company when he was 40 years old. His net worth was estimated to be an astonishing $199 billion when he died. And here's one of my favorite examples. Everybody knows this guy. They call him the Colonel. Yeah, that's right. The Colonel. Did you know that Harland David Sanders... After witnessing his father's death at an early age, getting multiple jobs as a young man, in winding up in a courtroom brawl with a client of his famously tumbling around, finding no success at the age of 62, founded what is now known as KFC today with more than 19,000 outlets available in 118 different countries and territories. 62 is when he got started. So the next time somebody takes a big steamer on you because of your age and writes you off, you tell them they can eat your words. Presented by the team at Prairie Catering. The team at Prairie Catering wants to remind you that they provide catering services for businesses large and small, now situated out of the absolutely beautiful Art Gallery of Alberta, and they've got a fabulous deal for those of you that may be looking to hire for office meetings in person or virtual. You can get 20% off any rental space at the Art Gallery of Alberta for your next function when you mention Eat Your Words on Real Talk, valid for 2021 rental dates you don't have to have grown up in the church to find this stuff fascinating you don't have to have grown up under the banner of evangelicalism to be intrigued by purity culture this is really really interesting stuff emily joy allison is based out of nashville tennessee the author of a new book church Two. the hashtag church Two. it's her debut book tackling abuses mostly centered on sexual purity in the evangelical world. Honored to welcome Emily Joy to Real Talk. Thank you so much for making time for us, and welcome to the show. Congratulations on the book. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, well, this, hey, this is a big deal because I would, I would imagine that you, know, you can hold a copy of your book in your hands right now, but there's years that have gone into this, and, and in particular, not just on the writing side, this is about your lived experience. Can you, take us, can you yeah. take us way back? 
Yeah, um, I mean, so I, I wrote this book um, definitely out of a place of um, having internal experience uh, with evangelicalism. It wasn't really like a research project for me. It was more um, something that came out of my life. I um, grew up a homeschooled pastor's daughter. I was the oldest of seven kids, uh, was raised in a very conservative evangelical uh, sect of Christianity here in the States. Um, and in fact, my undergraduate degree, which is in Christian theology, is from one of the most conservative Bible colleges in the country and stuff. So this is, I was very much like in this world. I was a part of it. I was very zealous. Um, and for me, I would call myself like a true believer. I think I really did. It wasn't just a thing that, oh, I went to church because my parents did. Like I took it very seriously and I was very um, earnest about it as a young person. How different or how differently would you describe yourself today? <laughs> much differently. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm about as far from that as you can get. Although, interestingly, I think I would still call myself um, Christian adjacent. I don't necessarily say that I would say like, yes, I'm a Christian. Um, but that's the world that I live in. That's the soup that I swim in. Um, that's the work that I do. What so. does Christian adjacent mean to you? I, 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 let me let me tell you, uh, Emily, you and I have similar upbringings. Um, okay. I, I, I grew up in the church, uh, attended a private Christian school right up until high school. I'm a graduate of Trinity Western University, which is a prominent Canadian. Canadian faith-based university. Cool. I have a diploma in theology from Cape and Ray Bible School, so I can t I can talk the language with you. Yes. I've never heard, though I've sat around campfires many nights until the sun comes up talking about this kind of stuff. I've never heard anybody talk about being a Christian adjacent. What does that mean to you? Um, I may have coined it. I don't know. Um, for me, it just means that uh, when you look at like, you know, for example, the creeds, right? A lot of churches are held together by like the Nicene Creed or the Apostles Creed. You look at that kind of stuff. I don't really believe that stuff. I, I look at it and I'm like, no, 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 don't believe this. Don't believe that. Not, not really my jam. Um, but I am connected to the church community. I am connected to the Christian community. This is the language that my heart speaks. This is the work that I know how to do. This is my life experience. I care about helping people in the church. Um, and I feel like I have the ability because of my life experience and my education um, to do that work. I, ha I know how to speak the lingo. I know how to talk about it. And so I feel like um, I'm a big believer in the get in where you fit in sort of model of justice work. And this is where I fit in. I love it. Before we get into the pages of the book, let me let me ask you, what was, what was your, um, you know, people might describe it as sort of a tipping point. But what, what was the impetus to your exit? At what point did your life start to change and maybe jump over to a different path? Yeah, you know, it wasn't really just one big thing. A lot of people have like a story of like, oh, this big tragic thing happened to me and then it like changed the course of my life. Um, it was really just a lot of small things over the course of time. And then one day I, I woke up and I was like, oh, I guess I just don't believe anything that I used to believe anymore. <laughs> but like, you're not exactly quite sure how it happened. You know, it's just sort of this slow, like, uh, like the river carving out the Grand Canyon. You know, it happens over time. So, so church too, um, a reference, right? Almost a direct mm -hmm. reference to the me too movement, the Absolutely. me too hashtag. Can, can you talk to us about how it came about? Yeah. Um, I mean, so the me too movement obviously had been around for, for a long time before it went viral in the fall of 2017, Toronto Burke had been using me too, um, to kind of organize, uh, women and specifically women of color who had experienced domestic violence for like a decade at that point. Uh, but in the fall of 2017, me too went viral. And at that time, you know, I, I knew that a lot of stories about sexual and sexualized violence in the church were out there. We, a lot of us knew that anecdotally, we had friends, we, you know, we talk amongst ourselves, this sort of thing, but they had never reached this sort of viral, you know, tipping point where news media, secular news media was really starting to pay attention. Um, but I felt like, you know, there was this moment I remember one day, and I don't even know who it was, because like I said, I was homeschooled, right? So I don't know any of the movie stars from Hollywood. I wasn't allowed to watch those movies. These guys get accused of like sexual abuse, and I'm like, who's that? And people are like, oh, you know, he did that movie. And I'm like, mm, wasn't allowed to see that one. Um, so, so, but it was like three or four guys in Hollywood or Washington that had gotten accused of, of sexual abuse this one day. And I, it kind of just pushed me over the edge. I was like, I think I have this weird story that I've been sitting on for like 10 years that I've never really talked about publicly. And like, I knew eventually I wanted to talk about it. And in that moment, I was like, I think now, I think now is the time that I'm going to come forward about this. So I tweeted about it. Um, and you know, I name names. Yeah. You've got it on the screen. Um, that's excellent. Um, what? and so, yeah, I, I named names. I got specific. I made this whole thread, um, in November of 2017 and, and right away that evening, a bunch of people started responding like, 
hey, something like this happened to me. And like, I also knew this girl in my church who had this thing happen to her and like my cousin, this, that, and the other, right? And I, I was like, whoa, this is like a groundswell. Like lots of people have experienced this. It's not just me. Cause I thought I was crazy for the longest time, especially as a young person. I mean, I was 16 when I was groomed for this relationship. So I didn't know any better. I didn't know how to get resources, how to connect to people. I didn't know that like religious sexualized violence was a thing. I had no category for that. Um, but you know, 10 years later I did. And so immediately I had been talking with some friends that night who had like encouraged me to come forward with my story and like kind of gassed me up um, on social media and stuff, you know, and, um, and one of my friends and I were talking and we were like, Hey, I think that, like this really deserves its own conversation. Like people are clearly hungry to talk about this. So like, let's, let's put out a hashtag, let's, you know, do this thing. And so we kind of added some ideas back and forth and settled on church too. Um, Cause it's short. It's not that many characters where like people will know what it means. Uh, and I went to bed, uh, and in the morning it had gone viral and it has been in use every single day, uh, for the last, you know, almost four years at this point. Almost so it's four kind of years. incredible. I mean, it's remarkable yeah. for, uh, you know, uh, Emily joy, most of the people that hear this will be listening on a podcast. So let me just read just a, a portion of the, the tweet of what you put out here. Oh, uh, sure. yeah. so, so this is what sort of kickstarted the whole thing. You say, Hey, so, uh, this is me being brave. This is me being brave as a result of so many women in the world being brave right now. This is me standing on your shoulders. I'm so thankful for all of you. You go on to say, when I was 16, I was groomed for abuse by a man in his early 30s who was a youth leader in my evangelical mega church, Northwoods Community Church in Peoria, Illinois. You, I, I don't have to ask, do you remember? Because I know you do remember what it felt like to hit tweet there what did that do to you yeah. though internally like this is in a way it's the culmination of a journey but it's also the first step on a new one yeah um I mean I so I was like drinking like a big old glass of rosé you know what I'm saying I just like had it next to me and I was like typing my stuff and I just like whoop, as soon as I hit tweet I just shut the laptop and I was like okay I'm gonna finish this glass of wine first and then I will come back to this I just need to take a break um, it was very scary. It was definitely a thing. Um, not so much because I didn't think I'd be supported. You know, at that point I had cultivated a community, um, that I knew was going to support me. I didn't think, um, that, you know, people were going to be, you know, mean to me about it or tell me they didn't believe me or something like that. I, I felt very loved and valued and supported by the community and the friends that I had at that point. Um, but it was more just like this, this thing, this weird, secret story that I have been keeping in my heart for 10 years is now like out there, you know, and it's no longer just this thing that I talk about privately with my therapist or like with close friends. It's, it's this thing that is, I don't know, it's weird making your trauma, um, consumable for other people. That's a whole other conversation. We can get into that some other time, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of a weird, it's a weird transition to make. Um, I was so glad that I did it, but it was still really scary. Making your trauma consumable. I've never heard anybody say that before, but it's so true. Uh, people talk about, you know, the, the triggering effect of so many things. And, and, I, and I know for some people it can be enough to, to, to paralyze you. I mean, we, we, you know, there are so many different things. We're, we're having conversations now, people that are being re-traumatized. Uh, I mean, here in Canada right now, talking about our legacy of residential schools and the survivors of these schools now decades later. Um, and, and it's so, it requires such a sensitivity, I guess I want to say, or an awareness, or we need to better educate ourselves as, as, as talk hosts and journalists and members of the public on how to talk about these types of things. But that's exactly what your book has done is it's opened up the door this hashtag church too. I mean, we were scrolling as a team here, we've been scrolling through it. And I mean, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable what people are sharing. What does that say to you? I mean, first of all, to know you're not alone, although I suspect you knew that already, but, but what does the, the, the viral nature of this say to you? Oh man. I mean, on the one hand, I'm always just so humbled by it because like I said, this was something that I kept inside for 10 years and, and it's such an incredible and just utterly disorienting experience to have this thing that had been this source of shame and trauma for you for so many years to then become this like catalyst for liberation for other people. And not just like my friends, not just people that I know that I'm in community with, but like strangers, hundreds and thousands of strangers have found liberation in this. And that's, I mean, that is every day I wake up and I'm like, I can't believe like, this is my life. Like, this is what I get to do. It's really, it's, it's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful and holy line of work. Um, I'm going to get like emotional about it, but, um, but yeah, I think also what it says, the viral nature of it says, 
um, especially in evangelicalism. And I don't, I don't know if there was this like evangelical Christian Catholic divide in um, Canada as much as there was in the States, but the, the evangelical sect of Christianity that I grew up in basically said like Catholics weren't Christians, right? Like they were so far off the beaten path of like real Christianity, quote unquote, that they weren't even Christians anymore. They were heathens. They were going to hell, all this stuff. That's what I was taught about Catholics growing up. And one of the big um, like kind of proofs of this was the Catholic sex abuse scandals, right? And so years ago before church too, um, Christian sex abuse was kind of seen as like a Catholic problem. It was like, that's just something they deal with in the Catholic church, but like not us over here, like we're fine. And so to me, the viral nature of this says that like, actually, this is a much huger problem than anybody has ever really had the guts to acknowledge. Uh, and it's definitely not just a Catholic thing. If anything, it might be worse. Um, there are so many people with such a huge variety of horrifying and tragic stories about things that have happened to them at the hands of the church and at the hands of devout Christian people attached to the church. And I mean, it is, it is the tip of the iceberg. Like it, when I say like apocalypse, I mean it in the genuinely biblical sense. Yeah. It is an apocalypse in that it is a revelation of what is going on and and, and uh, man oh man I, I i we need to keep here for six hours i'm i've been listening to <laughs> i've been listening to season three of gangster capitalism um the podcast that's talking about the Fallwells and liberty university and i don't know if oh have, yes have you heard it it is wild oh, i have not heard it oh it is wild emily you have to season three of gangster okay. capitalism so so yeah. but people are going to take a look and they're going to and they're going to pick your book up off the shelf again we're talking to emily joy allison who's got a brand new book do you say church two or hashtag church two by the way usually church two, church two. yeah it's up, up to you i want to i want to i want to sound like a like you know i want to sound like i can fit in with the young people here and i'm like hashtag <laughs> church two. anyway but uh but the point is your, your book is is interesting subject matter for people that would have not necessarily been exposed to evangelicalism and and, and can we also clarify you're talking about when you're talking about your, your former church in in Illinois, these mega churches, um, mm -hmm. Canada kind of has them. I, I, there's okay. there's like one in in Abbotsford, BC. There's big churches. We got, big, but when you talk about big churches in Canada, it's congregations of typically twenty five hundred or three thousand. These aren't like the big okay. Joel, Joel Osteen churches with with like seventy thousand people. It's a little yeah. bit different, but there's 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 still that emotion there. That I think that there was this fascinating. I mean, I personally uh, really want to pursue it. I want to do a documentary one day on on religious pop culture in the in the nineteen eighties and the nineteen nineties. I think that there was this unbelievable kind of a very a very interesting moment in time where a lot of things happened and paved the way for a lot of other things and a lot of talk uh, existed around so-called purity culture and you write about it here but but what people outside of the evangelical tradition may not be able to understand is how does purity culture essentially create a scenario that 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 could lead to sexual and other abuses i mean it it seems yeah. to be self-contradictory so what would you tell them how can you help us understand this yeah so this is like the million dollar question right and this is basically what i wrote my book to address because a lot of times really tragically um churches will say like okay we don't want sexual abuse obviously but like we're not willing to change any of our doctrine or theology we just want to get rid of sexual abuse but like keep all of our beliefs the same um and so what i wrote the book to kind of explicate is like that is actually not how that works. Um, and so it might be helpful if I define purity culture and I'll just, I'll um, define it out of the book the way that I read it or the way that I wrote it because I worked really hard on this definition. So I like to use it as much as possible. Um, but my definition of purity culture is as follows. Um, purity culture is the spiritual corollary of rape culture created in Christian environments by theologies that teach complete sexual abstinence until legal monogamous marriage between a cisgender heterosexual man and a cisgender heterosexual woman for life or else. Um, so that is my definition. It's, it's big and wordy. Um, but essentially like purity culture is this abstinence only gender binary, like no LGBTQ sexuality, like divorce is a sin. All of these types of things are purity culture. Um, and if you want to get rid of sexual abuse, but keep all those beliefs, you're going to have a really hard time because all of those beliefs 
are like demonstrably related to sexual abuse in a lot of ways. So I'll give you a couple and, and other types of abuse too, not just sexual. Sure. I'll give you a couple really, you know, easy examples. And um, one thing that's interesting is that um, at least here in the States, only in the last five to 10 years, have there really been any kind of like formal academic, like qualitative studies around this type of stuff. And it's happening more and more. So we're getting more data on how purity culture affects adults through the lifespan um, and sort of the consequences of the nineties to early two thousands purity culture as they have played out in people's real lives. Um, so we don't have a ton of data on everything, but a couple of things we do have really good data on is for example, um, the Trevor Project, which is our LGBTQ um, suicide lifeline here in the States, does uh, data every year and has found that um, youth in homes where someone is telling them their sexuality is a sin or trying to get them to change their sexuality um, are vastly more likely um, to have a suicide attempt um, or to die by suicide. And uh, another one is they have done studies uh, looking at uh, the way that complementarian gender ideology, which is a whole other kind of, you know, niche word, but basically it just means men and women are, um, equal, but different M women are supposed to submit and stay home. Men are supposed to lead and, you know, not stay home and not raise children. This, this type of, you know, rigid binary gender ideology. Um, they've done studies that have correlated that to acceptance of domestic and interpersonal violence myths. Um, which domestic and interpersonal violence myths are kind of a fancy word for um, believing things like uh, she was wearing a, a short skirt, so she was asking for it, or um, she made him angry, so it's fine that he punched her or whatever, right? If you believe these gender ideology things, you're more likely to believe these domestic and interpersonal violence myths, and belief of these domestic and interpersonal violence myths is correlated with greater perpetration of domestic mm -hmm. violence. Um, so there is a straight line from like this gender ideology to like actually hitting your wife um, right there. And that's just a couple examples. Um, when you have a community, this is just more generally, but I mean, if you just think about, if you have a community where like young people are told, like, you actually can't learn about your body. You can't express your sexuality in any kind of like developmentally appropriate ways. It's shameful. It's sinful. You need to control it. And Oh, by the way, like the men in this young, young people community are um, sort of in charge by virtue of being born with the genitals that they have. And the women are sort of, it's their job to like gatekeep and make sure everyone stays sexually pure and dress modestly. So you don't cause anyone to stumble. I mean, how is that not just like a flashing sign to predators saying like, you can definitely find your next victim here in our church. And we're probably not even going to call the police because we believe in forgiveness and second chances and redemption. So like we don't take other Christians to court because the Bible says not to. Mm -hmm. Right. So then you'll be able to church hop and go church to church to church to church going for your next victim, which is exactly what my abuser did. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just, it's this story that gets told over and over and over and like the details change, but the structure of it stays the exact same. Um, and it's really, it's really tragic. And we try, I think also it's, it's, well, disagree with you. I, I'd be curious to hear your take on it, but I think it's fair to suggest that I think that appearances count for a lot. And it's why I think, you know, I, I remember, you know, uh, attending uh, church services or participating in services where young people, high school aged kids would be up, uh, you know, behind the, the, the pastor's, the pastor's podium. And I mean, talking about their commitments to purity or their commitments to abstinence. And then there were so many conversations around, you know, things like becoming born again virgins, like people that would say, I made a mistake, but now I'm a born again virgin. And yeah. there's all this stuff on appearance, which I think also creates an environment where in some or many circumstances, people will put a lid on whatever they can to maintain appearances. Absolutely. Well, and I think that especially comes into play when you think about the fact that the way that like sexuality and your theology of sexuality um, has sort of become a litmus test of true Christianity, at least here, um, where it's like if you are if you don't believe that like gay people are going to hell and like abortion is wrong, then like you're not a real Christian. Like that's you know, that's what a lot of Christians here think. And I think given the way that like sexual purity has sort of become the, the boundary for, for a lot of Christians in the States, given the way that it's become like a gatekeeping mechanism, then it's especially about appearances because when abuse does then happen in their church community, they don't want anyone to find out. They're like, no, we can't let anyone find out because otherwise people will know that like this thing that we've used to like define our community is actually a farce and like, we're not really following it. You know, it really comes into play there. So what would you, I mean, ultimately when it comes to the future of the church, 
Um, mm. and, and I and I you know what I I, I appreciate with your. Uh, I, 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 I wish I could get to know you and, and really pick your brain. We had, I don't know if you've ever, have you ever talked to Chrissy Stroop? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Hi, Chrissy, Chrissy. Was, Chrissy was on the show a few months ago and oh, cool. we, I think we, we booked her for like 20 minutes and it ended up being about an hour because it's just <laughs> yeah. impossible once you start talking to her. But, but people come from different points, uh, you know, mm-hmm. with regards to their faith journey, but you don't strike me as somebody who, who has, uh, you know, who, who wants to, you know, burn down the church literally or metaphorically. I, I get the sense yeah. that maybe a part of your heart would like to see a healthy, thriving, positive community. Is, is that accurate? Well, I want to burn down churches that deserve it. Um, but, uh, but I would say this. Um, to me, it doesn't so much matter whether any individual church like lives or dies. Um, I care about harm reduction. So if, if you're a church community that is willing to put in the work, um, that is willing to you know, develop sex positive theology, resources for survivors, policies that support survivors, children, women, LGBTQ persons, other marginalized folks in your congregations, um, if you're willing to do that work and really commit to it, then like I support that fly and be free. I want you to exist because the, the, the ultimate story of this is that like churches have a lot of money and resources and volunteer powers and influence. And if we could get that like funneled for good, that would be amazing. Um, the tragic part of it is that most churches are not willing to do that work. You know what I'm saying? Most churches are not. And so for me, um, you know, I think the churches that are not um, should cease to exist. I, I, so it's not so much like, do I want to see the church live or do I want to see the church die? What I want to do is see the church stop hurting people. And you can do that by living or dying. I don't actually care, but you have to stop hurting people. That's what it's about for me. I uh, had a chance to meet a young fellow by the name of Harris, and he's 12, and he's going into grade 7, and he let me know so proudly, and his mom confirmed it, that he convinced his parents to lift the explicit block on their family YouTube channel so he could actually watch this show. He might be one of our youngest audience members. I was so impressed with Harris, and I'm so excited that his parents, his parents said this was a big step because now he can watch anything with an explicit rating on YouTube. They said, we're trusting you, Real Talk. We're trusting you to have conversations. The reason why this is relevant is because now Harris is in my mind and other young people, 12, 13, 15, 17 years old that are going to hear this podcast and then there's a whole bunch of parents too i mean this audience the sweet spot of this audience is 25 to 54 so there's going to be a lot of people that would be very interested young people and middle-aged people in some of the maybe this i want to say warnings ellie some of the red flags you could maybe put in front of us in retrospect looking back to to where you were as a 16 year old yeah what would you think that should be on everybody's radar I mean, so I've actually been talking about this. My fiance and I have been talking about this um, recently because we are looking forward to, you know, starting a family um, in the next soonish. Um, and we've been talking about, you know, how we want to handle religion and church and stuff with any child or children um, that might come our way. And um, and I was I was just telling her the other day. I was like, our no child of mine will ever go on a church mission trip, lock in, like event at the bowling alley until I call the pastor and have an interview about what are your abuse prevention policies? Um, do you have them clearly laid out on your website? Have all of your child care workers been through an abuse prevention training? Your denominations offer it. There's independent ones you can get. Have you, have you contracted with one of these independent ones if your denomination doesn't offer it? Like, have you ever had an experience of sexualized violence in this church? If so, how did you handle it? Can I talk to those people? Like, and I don't care if that makes me like the world's most annoying mother, but I just like, I, the church that I was abused in had no accountability structure to speak of none whatsoever. And, um, you know, I think, I think places are learning, um, (laughs) that we're learning that you have to have that now, but a lot of places still do not. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I don't think there is anything wrong with contacting pastors, contacting a youth pastor, asking those questions. If they can't answer those questions or if they get like, um, if they get kind of cagey about it or offended that you would think that something like that could happen there. Newsflash, it can happen everywhere. So there's no offense. There's no shame. You're not asking those questions because you think they're a predator. You're asking those questions because it's your due diligence as a parent. Like, so 
any and any place that gets cagey about it, that's a red flag. That's a red flag to say I don't want to send my child here to this to this community. Hmm. Ultimately, um, when you look back and, and I, I wish I, I don't know if you're paying attention to the live chat on the side of our screen on YouTube right now, but people are, you know, audience members are like, you got to bring her back already. Emma says, I'd be em- happy to. Emma I'd be says, happy to. yeah, I'd love to get you on with Chrissy. That would be amazing. Emma says it's <laughs> fascinating listening to her. Jeremiah's just bought your book. He says um, n- now that you're sort of looking back, I mean, you're holding the book in your hand. It's out. You're doing interviews. You know, th- as you said, the hashtag has been going for four years now. Um, how would you characterize where you're at now with, re- with regards to have you, have you found a resolution? Have, w- would you say that you've, you've gotten to a point now where, where that moment with the big glass of rosé when you hit tweet, yeah. did you get to the moment where you hoped you would? Yeah, um, I think, you know, it never gets it never gets easy mm. to talk about it. Um, but the, the, the hundredth time is easier than the first by far. Um, so you never really cross over into that easy territory, but I feel like I'm in a place now where I can talk about it, um, without it, you know, and sometimes, people, Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I'll be like, I have had lots of therapy. Like, so I, and I still go to therapy. Like I can talk about this. We're good. Um, and, and really like next steps for me are, are thinking about how to take this into, um, my fiance calls it a meat space, like off the computer into like real life. And we actually did, um, the other day about, a month ago, month ago and some change, um, we, and by we, I mean me and like seven other people, uh, did our very first um, in-person church to protest outside of a physical church building here in Nashville that was um, embroiled with a bunch of um, folks who both committed and covered up child abuse. And so we showed up on the sidewalk with our signs um, and made some folks uncomfortable. <laughs> um, and uh, the resolution to that is still kind of pending, but we have gotten some sort of minimal results from it um, that I didn't expect. And so it's really having, I was like, oh, we showed up with our signs on the sidewalk and then we like got some results. Um, so that was really cool. So we had our first protest. So for me, that was the first protest of what I hope to be many. I would love to continue doing like physical in-person protests. Um, I'm thinking about, I have future books in mind that I'm going to be kind of explicating more themes of faith and sexuality and getting more specific um, so I've got that, that's on my list of things to do this summer is get that second book proposal all wrapped up. But yeah, so that's, it's, it's definitely in a place where it has become, um, kind of a creative dream space for me to think about like how I can enact justice creatively in the world and less of like this thing where I'm just engaging with my trauma well, daily. And I think that is huge. Well, no, yeah, not just though, not just engaging. I mean, I, I, I don't have the comment in front of me, but one of our audience members earlier in this interview said, said uh, sharing your trauma can be a, a terrifying and wonderful experience. And, oh. uh, but like you said, this is almost like you get the sense, Emily, that you've, you've had a, do you go by Emily joy or Emily? What do you prefer? By Either the way? one's fine. <laughs> Emily, but you've, you, it's like, you've been, almost I mean to, to use almost religious vernacular it's like you've been called to this right I mean you, I, you yeah um, you, you've started so. so you've started an international conversation mm-hmm. yeah no I I do think I do think it's a calling and it's funny um I'll show you right here my so at the beginning of the year my um fiance did this thing with me and um some of the people that she worked with where she gave us all um words uh for the you know sometimes people choose a word for the year but, um, but we just kind of pulled ours out without looking at what it was. Um, and I've had mine on my computer this whole time. Um, but it's calling calling. Look at that. Um, and I think that the, the release of this book and having right. these conversations with folks, um, in the aftermath of the release of the book have really solidified for me that, um, in, in a very spiritual sense, this is a calling for me. Mm. Um, and that is why I think I still call myself Christian adjacent because I still believe in something like that. <laughs> um, but that's about as far as I go. I think, I think, oh, do we want to get into this? How much time do you have, Emily? I, I, I've got all the time in the world. Yeah, this is, it's, I, I love having these conversations because I'm so twisted up and, and uh, I mean, it's just, there's, it's so deep. It's so deep. And I know that we'll have these conversations on this show because we call it real talk and because we want to have meaningful, no bullshit type conversations and and push people and challenge people. 
and 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 investigate ourselves and and, and audit ourselves and and these types of things but it but it comes with blowback and i know that even this conversation that that we're having will be described probably when we promote it later today and the podcast goes out it will be described as more anti-christian rhetoric it will be described as another attack on religion or another attack on the church and and that stuff kind of stings too when when you have many people that you love that are still people of strong faith when i know that many people will write in to say that that our church has abuse prevention policies in place our church is a is a you know a community hub and we support we love all of these things and there are so many and every person's faith journey is different but the significance of somebody i mean the peter denying christ three in the cock crowed three times and he and and i mean the, the 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 one thing you know blasphemy the unforgivable sin in the bible to get someone of faith to even publicly acknowledge that they're even thinking about whether or not their church could be fallible whether or not it's possible that allegations could be true could be seen as heresy could be seen as blasphemy could be you know it's it's not a a normal or usual thing to see people in communities be willing to open themselves personally or to be willing to open up the congregation for these types of, you know, internal investigations, so to speak. So it's very significant when it happens, maybe even more so than most people might realize. Yeah. I think I would also want those people to know that like, I do work at a church. Um, like my, my day job is like basically a church secretary. Like I make bulletins, you know what I'm saying? So like, I'm not exactly like beating down the doors. I would say if you're worried about me destroying your particular church, I probably do want to. Um, but if you're, if you're not worried about me, like, you know, I'm, I'm only out to like, like I said, do harm reduction. I'm, I'm out to help churches, um, stop hurting people, whether that is by changing or dying. Um, but I'm, I don't have this strident, like anti-church stance. I think, um, churches can be very strategic, uh, pools of money and resources for good causes. If, if people organize them so. money, yeah, money, yeah, uh, how did how, have a lot of money? They have a lot of money. Do you think churches should pay income tax by the way? Oh man, this is a huge conversation that's happening <laughs> in the States right now. You know, I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of friends who are clergy of like very small congregations who are very against that idea. Um, And I understand why, because, you know, for their very small congregation, it would be such a small amount and it would be a huge burden on them and on the congregation for this, you know, it's like 40 old folks and they're like, well, that would put us under essentially. Right. But then like, like you were saying kind of at the beginning, we have, um, you know, the Joel Osteens where y'all don't really have the Joel Osteens. And I definitely think Joel Osteen should be paying taxes. So, um, I don't know, a church is just very so widely in structure and also morality here that it's hard to, it's hard to bring down one, you know, hammer of an answer on that. Hmm. Emily, how, how much of your, I mean, obviously you've written this book, uh, remarkably, uh, you know, I mean, putting your personal story out there in a way that obviously is, is creating an environment where so many other people can start to process or share or talk about their own trauma. And it's really impacting change. Um, how much of your perspective on the church or on religion do you think is also shaped by, I mean, you're, 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 you're a same sex partnership. Obviously you're, you're, you're very, uh, proud and open about that. It's not something you're hiding. Has that shaped your, your, perception of religion or community or God even? You know, it's definitely shaped my perception of, of God and of, and of community. Um, and especially of, of the idea of family. Um, because I think, uh, you know, the queer community just has, uh, such unique ways of building family and of creating family because most of us, um, many of us have, um, either, bad or non-existent relationships with, with biological family, myself included, although, um, I have no relationship with most of my biological family, not because of being gay, um, but because of purity culture stuff, they kind of disowned me even before I came out. Um, but, but yeah, I think it's definitely changed my, my perspective on like family and, and community and God. I do think, um, I came out kind of, I don't want to say later in life because I'm only 30, but um, later than a lot of people do. I was actually married to a man for about four years um, and divorced and am now, you know, partnered with a woman. But um, it was interesting to me. I think um, my coming out process, I think was a little easier because I had already so much distanced myself from like the evangelical church 
and, you know, harmful family members and that sort of thing that I, I didn't feel a lot of like consternation about coming out because I wasn't in that toxic homophobic environment anymore. Um, so by the time I did come out, it was, you know, it was a very, it was like a water birth. You know what I'm saying? It was a very like gentle sort of welcoming ex experience in that. So very poetic. I love it. I, I got a, a very, uh, a, a very strong visual when you said that so it's, <laughs> it works. Water birth. That could be the name of your second book. Maybe right, you know, yeah. people can check out the, the work that you do at emilyjoypoetry.com. That's your Twitter mm -hmm. handle as well at Emily Joy Poetry, the new book church Two: how purity culture upholds abuse and how to find healing the author, the remarkable Emily Joy Allison, it's been such a pleasure having you here on the show. Thank you for this. Thank you very much. I would love to love to talk again anytime. The uh, door will always be open, Emily. Thanks. Um, you know, every once in a while with an interview, and it's, it's a heavy subject matter, you feel at the end like you kind of almost made a friend. Mm. But she's very likable, and she's talking about seriously heavy and traumatic things, her personal journey, a survivor, uh, and, and what started with a tweet and has now become literally a movement yeah. and a published book. And to be able to just talk about it so matter of fact, I just have such a huge amount. I try to say this from time to time. If you listen to the show all the time, uh, you know I'll say this. But I'll probably say it once a week or once every couple of weeks. Or I just want to I want to pause and recognize the significance of somebody coming on to talk about something. Because I'm about to blow into some promotional spots. And then we're going to talk about something fun and silly. But let, let's just be present for a moment. Mm. And recognize what Emily Joy was just willing to do, what she got up for this morning, which was to to dig it all up and talk about it again. I know that for some of you, I've seen some comments that you, you, you've described that it's difficult for you to hear things like this because of your own personal experiences. My heart is with you. I appreciate the fact that you're here for this. And of course, we never take it personally. If every once in a while you say real talkers, I'm going to take a little time out for my own mental health. It's uh, always a positive thing. We want to remind you that, that, that this studio is, is powered by, the show is being brought to you by Westworld Computers. They give us the horsepower that we need to keep real talk on the air. And if you check out westworld.ca right now, you can check out the new lineup that they've got of the iMac. That's the big unit that Sam has in front of him on the desk, live streaming real talk each and every weekday morning. You can also book a service appointment, more than 40 years experience at the family-owned Westworld Computers. The team at Local Waste loves to talk trash, and they love to fight for your business. They're not afraid to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with their competitors, even if those competitors currently have you under contract. Local Waste will commit its resources to get you out of bad contracts with their competitors. Why not give them a call today and see what a positive, symbiotic, small business relationship could look like at localwaste.ca. A reminder that we're calling for submissions to Trash Talk, although let me say we could do Trash Talk right now and have a strong as hell lineup. So this week, you, there's a fire lit under you, Real Talkers. Talk at RyanJesperson.com is where you can submit your trash talk. Also want to remind you that St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge are online all the time with Alberta's best inventory of Ram trucks and the Jeep lineup, which includes the Grand Wagoneer. Everybody in the luxury SUV market's looking for the Grand Wagoneer right now. It's going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the Escalade and the Navigator and the X5 and all the other big luxury brands, but with that brand that people have trusted since 1941. Get your Jeep today at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. Park Power powers our hashtag RealTalkRJ, and on their website right now, if you use the promo code 2021-RealTalk, you can save 70 bucks off your first bill. Electricity, natural gas, and internet. And a reminder, my favorite thing about this company, aside from maybe their Instagram account, is the fact that 10% of their electricity profits go to nonprofits, and you get to choose which one from a big long list on their website at parkpower.ca. So we have covered today some provincial politics and uh, we have covered federal politics and we have covered purity culture, which has been fascinating. But we have not yet talked about the wobbling moon. Is it a wobbling moon? Is it the wobbling moon? All we know at this point, because we've not yet talked to our expert guest, is that a new NASA study predicts that the moon wobble could bring a surge in coastal flooding in as soon as 10 years from now. 
That's obviously a big deal if you live in coastal communities or for everybody, let's be honest. But here's the thing. It's not new. Let's find out what's going on with this. Dr. Sharon Morsink is a professor in the Department of Physics at the University of Alberta, where she teaches introductory, intermediate and graduate level physics and astronomy courses. Doctor, welcome to the show and thanks for making time for us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. I was I was happy when I saw your bio here, and, and it lets us know that you also, you, you as part of your lineup, you teach introductory courses, because I'm going to have to ask you to really, really dumb this down. But what's going on right now, this new NASA study? What did it tell someone like you who knows what you're talking about? Well, it sort of, when I read it, I started realizing, geez, you know, maybe that's kind of obvious. The the main thing is that we know that there are cycles when we have high tides where the water level can be very high. And we also know that there are time periods when you have very low uh, uh, high tides and there's this is cyclical. But yet we also have global warming taking place where we have a lot more water uh, being melted from glaciers, for instance, and we expect there to be a very slow rise in the sea level. And when you add these things together, you would expect then to be seeing more flooding events taking place during high tides. So th- is this directly attributable to climate change or is it a contributing factor or is it totally unrelated? It's a contributing factor. Um, we already have um, high tides where you might have more flooding, but what's going to happen is it's going to be much more extreme and it's going to happen much more often because of global warming. What causes, like, if I were to explain this to my soon-to-be six-year-old who might know more about the solar system than I do, what would I be able to tell him that would make sense that why the moon wobbles? Okay, so um, the, the, what we mean by the wobble of the moon, so wobble is not the word that I would use. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, is the moon orbits the Earth on a plane that's different from the plane that the Earth orbits the sun. So first of all, that's not wobble. So what I'm going to do here is actually, I've got a model that I use in some of my first year courses. I'm, I'm hoping that this will show up okay. So this is big wooden model. Yeah. Okay. And so imagine that we have the sun over here at the center and this flat circle over here. Oops, I just dropped the earth. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, this flat plane represents the plane that the earth orbits around the sun so it orbits around the sun like that um uh, ignore the fact that the sun's wobbling over there (laughs) it doesn't do that um and in fact the earth orbits in such a way that the spin of the earth is tilted by 23 and a half degrees and so it it goes kind of like this as it orbits okay so that's the orbit of the earth around the sun but now if you notice that this model has this this ramp on it so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to put the earth over here and the idea is that the moon orbits the earth on this inclined ramp and maybe a different way to think about it is i just you know you you oh that's that's beautiful although that's that's showing something different that's showing the elliptical orbit of the of the moon around the earth and oh, we'll boy. talk about that too. oh boy okay <laughs> so so if we have the earth over here and my room over here is the plane that the earth and the sun orbit. The moon orbits on a plane that is tilted by five degrees. And you could think of the plane that the moon orbits the earth as being represented by this uh, CD-ROM. And if you wonder why they make these things, so you can do astronomy. Exactly. Um, Demonstrations (laughs) and posters. Yeah. Exactly, and coasters too, I guess. Uh, anyway, so here's here's the Earth where my finger is at the center, and the orbit of the Moon goes around like that. And so this is five degrees, which is not a very big angle. But what happens is over an 18 year, it's actually 18.6 years, I believe, um, the plane of this orbit precesses so that it's pointing in a different direction of the sky. So that is what they mean by the wobble. And so during this time, the moon is orbiting around the earth every 29 and a half days, but the direction that the plane is pointing in in the sky changes 
on approximately 18 and a half years. Um, and that precession has to do with the fact that we also have the gravitational attraction of the sun, which kind of perturbs things. A little so bit. does that mean that every 18 and a half years, coastal communities are more at risk of serious flooding events? And does it also mean that the trend almost it, it ebbs and flows? And so the risk would be higher some years and lower in others? That's right. There's an 18 and a half year uh, cycle that with ebbs and flows of how high the tides are. Uh, because of this cycle. Wow. So this was first discussed as uh, we were reading up on this. I mean, it's obviously fascinating and I love how you're able to make this relatable and understandable to us plebs here. But this was first reported in 1728. Uh, that's that's way before we like gave people anesthesia for surgery. It's way before we understood anything about antibiotics. It's way before. How does that just blow your mind like it blows mine? Actually, I'll just comment that um, this cycle, I think, was understood for much longer than that. Is this that right? Is just where, this is just where it was reported in a in Western science. And this is maybe not necessarily to do with the tides. It's just the cycle of the moon that we're talking about here. But if you look at ancient cultures and, well, present day cultures that actually, actually watch the sky and are in tune with the moon, they're aware of this. And so, for instance, if you go to southwestern United States, there's a place called Chaco Canyon, which um, has uh, old structures that are about a thousand years old. And there are petroglyphs in there and places where there's shadows that lie on the petroglyphs in different locations that show that it was designed to actually predict when this 18 and a half year cycle would be taking place. So this is the kind of thing that people who actually watch the sky have been aware of for thousands of years <laughs> you should see our chat Pe people are people you're blowing people's minds right now uh, but but there's there's one comment in particular i hope this doesn't make your head explode doctor uh, apologies in advance Dwayne, who's watching us live says uh, doctor what would you say to people who say that the earth is flat well i guess you haven't traveled in an airplane <laughs> and traveled from uh, one part of the world to another part of the world is all I can say. Okay, we'll get back on track. <laughs> I'll get back focused here. Um, would you, I just, the, the question popped up in our live chat and I sort of, I couldn't help myself. I thought I have to know what Sharon's going to say about this. You know, it was fascinating. We were doing, uh, there was a, I guess it was about three years ago. There was a flat earth conference and uh, and there were a whole bunch of people showing up and and and, and audience members of, of a radio audience I had at the time were saying to me, you've got to get a flat earther on the show. And I said, well, I got I've, I've got to be honest, because kind of my uh, my 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 hesitation was that I would come across as a real prick, like I'd be ve I'd be very condescending and I wouldn't be able to help myself uh, because well, because. And so then I thought, well, maybe we could do like a debate where we could get uh, someone like yourself, actually, and and a flat earther to come on, like, but not a not just your average flat earther, like one of the leading flat earthers. You know what I mean? And uh, you know what we discovered? The flat earther uh, confirmed availability immediately, uh, eager to, of course, promote the conference and have the conversation. We couldn't find a scientist that wanted to go on the show and actually participate. Like they were, they were like, we're not dignifying this debate. We're not dignifying this by showing up and debating this person. It was actually fascinating to see. Um, yeah, uh, I was going to say that often those kind of discussions aren't really done in good faith. Like your, your flat earther is not really willing to actually talk about evidence is, is typical. So. Yeah, I sometimes wonder uh, if the flat earthers <laughs> actually really believe the earth is flat. And, and something tells me there's there's something else going on. Like they're making money off of most yeah, things. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like there's got to be something else to it. Let me ask you this then. So, I mean, you know, how, how very real is the risk? Because we talk about, we understand that coastal communities, I mean, for all their beauty and all the draw, I mean, there's a reason why it's $4 million to get a condo in Vancouver. Everybody wants to live there and it's fabulous, but we also know they're, they can be on, on fault lines more susceptible to things like earthquakes. Uh, and of course, there's this, the, the some will say the inevitability of flooding events would you knowing what you know would you live in a place like vancouver how, how sort of seriously do you take this um 
it's quite possibly going to be much more of an issue in 10, 20 years. So if that's your timeline, you know, you might want to think twice about it. Um, every, the issue about flooding and how high tides are depends very much on the shape of the coastline. So that's a very complicated thing to model. Also, this effect in particular is, I think, supposed to be stronger, closer to the equator than it is at northern latitudes. Um, so, but what happens is you have locations like, so for instance, the Bay of Fundy in, uh, in, uh, in New Brunswick, where you have sort of this long funnel bay and you tend to get very high tides there. And there's other places on the earth that where you have sort of a much more simple coastline and your changes in the tides aren't as much. And so you would probably want to study what the variations in the tides are by looking at tide tables or just reading these forecasts much more. Um, the study that was recently published, they were looking at particular locations in like Florida and um, other parts of coastal United States, a little further south. And they were modeling what the coastlines were there and trying to um, figure this out. And um, it, all I can say is it looks pretty plausible. I mean, I'm not an expert on on water levels and sure. and how they're going to be changing, but it, it does seem uh, like there's probably going to be a lot more issues for these people. Well, it's 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 fascinating to you know, and we're talking about you, and and obviously you're a, a professor of physics. You you instruct in astronomy. Do you consider yourself? Would you say are you a physicist or an astronomer or both? How do you prefer to be characterized? <laughs> um, I, I'm both. I guess I call myself an astrophysicist. So astrophysicist. I use physicist. That's yes. Uh, yes. I, I Thank use you. Physics you, to you know what? You, you, you just did that with such grace. You did that to, to say to me, I guess, Ryan, I'd probably call myself an astrophysicist because that's what I am. But do you, you know, we talked to a wildfire scientist a couple of weeks ago and and he's like everybody has their own. I think people's professional backgrounds. And in some circumstances as well, and anecdotal factors and, and who people talk to and where they live, these all factor into how they process or how they feel about things like climate change. And I learned something in that interview. I actually had no idea uh, that, that uh, climate change was leading to increased lightning activity and then, of course, increased lightning strikes and then, of course, increased wildfires. I had no idea that there was more lightning now than there was before. As an astrophysicist... Uh, does does that give you a unique angle on talking about things like climate change? Do, is there a correlation, or is there does that give you a certain lens through through understanding? Oh, m most certainly. Um, so I guess I guess what you're talking about with lightning strikes, and now we're talking about with the flooding, is sort of lots of different examples about how climate change is going to be be making life more difficult for us in the future. Yeah. Um, for me, um, you know, I see it a little bit more. Um, we, we study the greenhouse effect, for instance, which is basically what leads to climate change. And that's these particular types of gases, um, like for instance, carbon dioxide is an example of one of these, which have the ability when they vibrate to absorb infrared light. And so visible light from the sun strikes the earth, warms up the earth and the earth irradiates infrared light. Some people think of this as kind of like heat, but it's it's a type of light. And this light goes into the atmosphere and carbon dioxide has the ability to basically absorb and scatter and it sends the infrared light downwards and it basically leads to the warming effect. And so for us, that's a really important effect. And that's something that we look at. Um, well, it's an important effect because it makes the earth warm enough for us to live on. The Earth would be about 30 degrees colder if we didn't have any greenhouse effect at all. So when we talk about can we live on certain planets around other stars, we have to incorporate the greenhouse effect in order to understand whether um, whether the climate would be likely to be good for us or not. Hmm. Do you think we're moving in the right direction as a society? Let me ask you as a nation when it comes to investing in, in research and our understanding of the cosmos and space exploration and all that kind of stuff. It's there, the, you know, I've, I've seen people say in these talks that we were, we were joking earlier about the billionaires and their race to space and how, you know, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and, and Richard Branson and others are seeing opportunities to get out there. 
And I've seen people leave comments like, well, I guess now that we've solved, you know, malaria and child starvation and AIDS and, and abuse and boil water advisors, now that we've solved it all, you guys, I guess it's fine that we're going to space. Obviously, very facetious in that commentary. A lot of people don't perceive there to be value in understanding things, uh, you know, outside our own uh, ozone layer, maybe you'd say. Um and then there's also been bold commitments from some political leaders that have said we're going to, you know, Donald Trump and the Space Force or other presidents investing in space or Canada's commitment to, to sending astronauts back up there. How are we doing based on your perspective? Are we where we should be? So there's two aspects of that. There is the aspect of trying to understand what is out there. And some of it is at a very abstract level. So, for instance, I study um, small weird stars called neutron stars and you might not think that that really has much to do with anything on earth but it's part of the bigger picture of trying to understand what's out there which helps us understand what's happening here on earth um an important thing that we need to do in science is to study the effects of what we do on earth to our own climate and that's a really important thing for us to study um studying how to make better space technology, like sending people into uh, in, in rockets to the International Space Station and these latest billionaires. That's that has some value as well. Although, you know, the whole space tourism thing, I think, is not really scientific value. That's more getting humans to just be kind of um, I don't know to aware. spend a quarter million dollars. Yeah, they, <laughs> yeah, that's what it's to get them to do. <laughs> it's like a nice thing to do if you're rich. I yeah, guess. yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, so, I mean, Canada vastly underspends on science. Um, our Canada's per capita spending is very small compared to what, say, the United States spends on science. Of course, the United States is a, a leading nation for, for, for science research. Um, we, we do pretty good in Canada, but I think we could do a lot better. Um, and I think that as, um, you know, there's going to be some key things like understanding climate change better and how to mitigate it are things that we should probably be investing in, as well as investing in things like trying to understand types of energy generation, for instance, that is not going to be uh, producing so much um, greenhouse gas emissions. And for instance, here in Alberta, uh, we could be getting much more into um, renewable energy and become an energy powerhouse that way. And mm -hmm with a little bit of investment, we could be doing that. And so I think there could be some really key investments in those directions that we could actually be doing a lot better on. When did you, how old were you when you knew you were going to do what you do? Oh no. Um, well, maybe my first uh, little hint that I might want to go in this direction was probably maybe around age 12 or so. And um, like I, I learned that you could write to NASA and they would send you information about space. So I wrote them a letter saying, hi, I'd like to know something about space. And they sent me this giant package full of brochures about rockets and different uh, planets and, and neutron stars and black holes. And that just was amazing. And it's an experience that kids don't get nowadays because they just see it on the internet. But getting it in the mail in a package addressed to you is amazing. Yeah, no kidding. You had to wait like two weeks for it and you didn't know if it was going to arrive. And when I didn't it know did, what I was going to get. Oh, man, what a moment. Yeah. And meantime, here I was just signed up for the Sandy Lion Sticker Club. You're, you're, you're paving the way to become an astrophysicist. Dr. Sharon Morsig, a professor in the Department of Physics at the University of Alberta. This has been so much fun, and I feel like I actually could maybe kind of sort of explain this to my six-year-old now. Thank you. You're welcome. I love it. What a fun conversation. Hoyle's hitting it out of the park on the show today. Aww. Very well done. Thanks, boss. Yeah, Emily, Emily Joy and and Dr. Morsink and Warren Kinsella, and, and I love it. If you have thoughts on what you've just heard, this stuff just blows my mind. And then I want to start asking her all kinds of things, like, do you think we're going to end up moving to Mars? And, and she's probably, her eyes are like... You know, her friends are going to text her right now. Say, we heard you on Real Talk. And she's and, and there she's going to say, what was the over under on the flat earth question? Yeah. <laughs> Someone will say nine minutes. Yeah. I think we hit the over on that. I think we I, I hope we hit the over on that. But uh, sure. Appreciate Dr. Morsink hanging out with us and, and hope that you've learned something at home. This is great. We want this always to be a show where you're never going to look silly. 
in front of your friends. You're always going to know what's going on. And if they say, what's up with MLA Pat Rain in Alberta coming back to the Conservative caucus, you can say, well, I heard on Real Talk that, you know, it might be due to this or, or maybe it was because of that. But here's what people are saying about it. And then they'll say, yeah, but what about Federer? Does he ever talk? And you go, yeah, well, they talk. They had Kinsella talking about the prime minister. And then what other cool stuff? Well, I learned how to make my dog famous yesterday. People will say, wow, that sounds like the kind of show I should subscribe to. We wanted to give a big shout out to those of you that stream our audio live on Mixler, on the Mixler audio app every morning. We know uh, that a lot of you have subscribed to us on YouTube. We'd love to see more. And of course, subscribing to our podcast. But there are members of this community, this audience that listen to us. You can stream us on the go. Maybe through your, your, your dashboard application in your vehicle or on your phone, you're listening to live streaming audio. You're treating this like a radio show. And yesterday, a monumental moment as yesterday, we hit 125,000 live streams on Mixler, Woo! which was really exciting for us. It pushes us well past the 2 million download mark, and it's really blowing our mind. We're so appreciative to the guests. I'm appreciative to the staff and the team here. So appreciative to our subscribers. That's you that show up every single morning. And of course, to our sponsors. That includes the team at Friesen Brothers. The minute that they heard that we were doing this, they were in. They're big on things that are grown in Alberta, if you know what I mean. For more than 65 years, Friesen Brothers has been putting out Alberta's best produce, best proteins, and everything else. And you know what? They're living it. They're practicing what they preach. They're walking the talk. They're keeping bees on the roof of their new South Edmonton store. Pretty soon you're going to be able to get honey that was literally created on the roof of the store where you're buying it. How mind-blowing is that? That's just one thing I could talk to you about a million. Next week, we want to let you know we're going to be giving away barbecue packages. For those of you that live relatively local, details coming up on that next week. Also, a shout out to the team at Eden Landscaping. This is a great week to check out their work. You can see them online at landscapeedmonton.ca. It's a great way to get a sense of the types of projects that they excel at, bringing outdoor spaces to life. It's what they've been doing for more than 20 years. The thing that Mike tells me of Eden Landscaping that he's most proud of is the referrals and the return business. He says that the business has grown with a lot of the families. He says we'll start doing a relatively modest backyard for them, and then they build their dream house years later. It's our honor to do that, too. You can find Eden at Eden Landscaping, rather, landscapeedmonton.ca. And a huge shout-out to the team at Dairy Queen, the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, a small confession. Last night, I did not force myself to choose between a Buster Bar and a Dilly Bar. My name is Ryan, and I ate them both. You can get your ice cream treats at the Dairy Queens and Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road, and I regret nothing! Equal opportunity. Thank Equal you very opportunity. much. True impartiality, folks. No bias here. Those are the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Can I read an email before we go? I love this. We received no, this from allowed. Louise. Nope. Nope. You may have seen <laughs> that our friends at Radio Canada did a national feature that ran on Real Talk. They're talking about how this is the voice of the West. And I encourage you to check it out. It's on my Twitter. I'm absolutely totally humbled by it. And I'm so gracious, uh, grateful. And, um, and we've heard from, from I would say, a, a pretty significant number of Francophone Canadians. We're seeing a real uptick on Twitter followers uh, from Eastern Canada. And it's really, really exciting how we're broadening the conversation. I love the assertion in the story that Real Talk is proving that national conversations do not have to originate in the East, which is the truth. And I love this from Louise. Louise writes in to say, good day. First of all, I apologize. My English is not perfect, but here are some personal comments. She says, I, I, I've, I've seen your, or I've read about your show and I've now seen it as a French Canadian. And I, I wanted to remind your audience, and I hope that everybody understands that we are all in the same country. I hope that we all understand that what I am doing or what I'm talking about is not related to the oil business or who is doing what, but about having a vision of where we want to go together. She says, I'd, I'd like to encourage real talkers to take a look at the country of Costa Rica. It, it, it thrives on nature and ecotourism. And in Canada, we have plenty to offer without destroying our natural beauties. Number two, we are a people who can create green technology, and that should be accomplished in every province, working together, creating benefit for all Canadian citizens. Number three, I believe that economy and the environment can coexist and be healthy at the same time. It is a matter of leadership. And number four, every citizen should travel coast to coast 
You will find out we are not that much different. It is all about perception based on what people hear, not understanding one another. She says, my point is we need to be more proud of who we are as Canadians. Work together for equality and fair shares and stop thinking so unidimensionally. Incidentally, I do not know the French translation for unidimensionally. So Louise is one up on me. She says, I've bicycle she says i've made a bicycle trip across the americas we should book her to talk about that she says i was surprised to see that you know we, we never really get involved in a lot of projects when it comes to international development we rely a lot on our partners in the u.s latin america is looking to secure a better future we should be looking for more international partnerships around the world people are seeking new technologies that is more efficient with fewer impacts on the climate, we can be the leaders as Canadians. It's not the size of the population, but how we operate. Louise says, you may categorize me as a dreamer, but when people put their differences away and set a common goal and learn from one another, we will be surprised at what we can accomplish. If we can stop pointing, figure, pointing fingers or hoping for magical solutions, if we look to the future, we have our water, our beautiful lakes and forests, our beautiful northern territories, our technologies, and we have the creatives. We just need to believe in ourselves and not be afraid of who we are. I am proud to be French, but I am also proud to be Canadian. And all I want is our country to show that there is a way to a better world. That from Louise, our moment of inspiration today on Real Talk. I'm already looking forward to tomorrow. As mentioned, we're going to talk to the chief of Cowessus First Nation, we're going to get into Trash Talk presented by Local Waste and a roundtable con- sexuality and disability. That's coming up on Friday's Real Talk. Between now and then, we encourage you to make it a wonderful day. We'd love to hear from you, what you think about this show, past shows, or what you'd like to hear in future. Thanks for making this part of your day, friends, and we'll talk to you soon.